Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second Friday in the North American Carbon Program Open Science Meeting. On behalf of myself and Dr. Gami Shressa, who is the director of the US Carbon Cycle Science Program, we are thrilled to have you be joining us and um, for, I think, what will be a very um, interesting and exciting series of events today. I wanted to begin with a land acknowledgement. Creating a land acknowledgement for a virtual meeting is challenging as we have participants from all across North America and beyond. But the majority of our attendees are, atten are participating from places where governments have committed atrocities against indigenous Native American and First Nation peoples. Our history also includes those who were kidnapped and brought here in the name of colonization and imperialism. Despite the theft of this land, this is still indigenous land. We need to learn, protect, and honor the history of the people and places that we live in. We honor the lives of all who endured and continue to endure in the face of settler and colonial oppression. This map that you see on the right um, is from nativeland.ca and is a good, that is a good place to start for resources about learning more about indigenous lands and um, current status. Thank you. I also want to remind everyone that when you registered for the meeting, you agreed to abide by the meeting code of conduct. And this means that everyone is treated with respect and consideration. Um, it's important that we be able to express our diversity of views and opinion, but to do so in an appropriate way. Please be considerate and respectful and collaborative in your engagement. Um, communicate openly, critiquing ideas rather than individuals, of course, avoiding personal attacks, and be mindful of your surroundings and your fellow participants. Uh, this obviously um, will be especially important later today when we have our breakout sessions, um, but also just even in the Slido and other sort of opportunities for interaction. If you have any concerns or you need an ally, there are several people that you can contact, including myself or Gami Shrestha, Megan McGrady, or Peter Griffith, all of whom emails are listed here, and you can also find them on the meeting website. So just to review uh, the logistics for this meeting, um, you should have, if you got here, you had the emails that had the links with um, the YouTube and you can and other links that you need to be able to participate. And you can also always find those links on the web page after on the meeting website um, after you log in. So if you are ever stuck, you can always just log into the meeting and look at that. So as an attendee, you've probably already figured out that you will be viewing the events on YouTube. Um, I'm really thrilled that we have over 500 people registered for this meeting. So that's really uh, means that it's difficult to say um, all interact in a YouTube, uh, I mean, sorry, a big WebEx environment. And so instead, we're going to um, have all of the talks and the and the panels streamed via YouTube. For best viewing, we suggest that you make the uh, your YouTube window full screen. And um, sometimes people, I guess, have reported a couple issues with resolution. Um, that's unfortunately usually a bandwidth issue on the viewers side. Um, so just as a reminder, all of the individual talks are always available for viewing at any time on the meeting website. And um, it takes a few days, but uh, we will also be posting a video of the live interactions afterwards too for on the website for folks to view. If you would like to ask a question, the way that you do that is via Slido. So you open a web browser and you go to slido.com slash NACP and you can type your question. You have the option to both ask a question anonymously, um, but also to use your name. You're free to do either of those. Don't be concerned if you don't see your question appear immediately. We are moderating questions just to be sure that things um, are appropriate and we're not kind of getting Zoom bombed by, by folks. Um, and then you'll see also questions that other people have asked. And the nice thing about Slido is that it offers the opportunity to upvote questions. So if you see that somebody has already asked what you were going to ask, you can just upvote it, um, etc. 
Um, and then today and next week, we are having our breakout sessions. Um, those are going to happen via a WebEx room. Those, the links to those rooms were in the bottom of the email that you received, along with the session names. You can view the full descriptions on the meeting website that describes what the goal and approach is for each of those breakout sessions. And I hope that you um, will join us for those. That would be really great. Next, so. Um, Obviously, we're not in a big in person meeting where we can bump into people um, during the coffee break. So we wanted to figure out ways to be able to enhance interactions um, with the presenters and the audience. And one way that we've done that is that um, all of the talks are pre recorded and can be viewed at any time on the meeting website. So you just click on the link there that says recording. And then we've also implemented a comment and question um, ability so that if you click on that little sort of chat box thing, it will allow you to leave a message for the presenter. Um, it does require login again, just to cut down on spam and the notifications. It's not instantaneous, so the notification happens nightly. So the presenter will get a message saying, hey, somebody left a, a comment or a question on your presentation. And then if the presenter responds, you will in turn then receive a notification that there's been a response to um, to that. So that is a, a useful tool that we hope that you will all use. Um, similarly, so we are not having a dedicated live time to poster presentations. Um, we have more than 125 posters that have been submitted for this meeting, which is super exciting. And we encourage everybody on their own time to go ahead and explore the poster agenda and the posters that are there. You click on the link and you can search for uh, view the posters by scientific theme. And then you could also say search by keyword or by the presenter's name to find them. And then similarly, um, we have the comment uh, button that is set up for that as well. We also um, have the link to view the poster itself. If it has the little uh, graduation cap next to it, it means that that um, person is participating in our out student, I'm sorry, outstanding student presentation competition. And then we've also given um, folks the option to uh, have a five minute up to five minute recording of a walkthrough of their poster so that they can kind of explain all the different components of it. And hopefully that will mean that you can uh, get even more out of understanding the poster. And again, please do contact the presenter if you have any specific questions that that you'd like to um, to ask them. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, if you missed last week, you can view pretty much all of it online. So we, you know, we had this amazing keynote um, about what does the carbon science community owe communities of color, future generations and other underrepresented groups. Um, we had agency updates. We had two different science sessions on stakeholder engagement and diagnosis and attribution. Uh, we had the presentation of our survey results from the diversity assessment, and we also had the first round of the student poster competition speed talks. So you can see all of that on the meeting website and view the videos from then as well. And now I just want to take a moment to give some really uh, deep thanks to, first of all, the planning committee, who actually, I think, convened um, pretty much about two years ago because this meeting was originally planned for last March and obviously had to be postponed. So it's been a, an exceptionally long commitment on the part of um, the members of the committee and um, they have done, in my opinion, a really great job at figuring out how to take what was supposed to be an in-person meeting and transform it into what I think will be a very uh, informative and interesting virtual session. So um, you can find all of their names here and also on the meeting website. And then this meeting would not happen at all without the really outstanding support staff that we have. And so I want to specifically thank Heidi Allen, who is the, our meeting planner at UCAR, um, Brian Caracapa, who is our AV tech, who is um, just outstanding and making things run smoothly. And then the NASA Carbon Cycle and Ecosystem Support staff, who um, have just done an amazing job of making the meeting website work and being able to support um, me and getting this all sort of worked out together. 
And then, um, of course, we want to thank our sponsoring agencies, NASA and USDA NIFA for grants that we received to be able to make this meeting happen. And with that, we will now begin our next keynote session. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction to today's um, uh, set of panels and meetings, Libby, and, and thanks everyone for their support of um, hosting this in, in a virtual format. Uh, the panel today, uh, we, we can jump right in, uh, is on why do we need IPCC special reports? Um, the panel will be moderated by myself, Ben Poulter. Uh, I'm a research scientist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and my colleague, Dr. Ceci Chapa, uh, a professor at Universidad del Mar in Oaxaca, Mexico. And we are fortunate to have uh, with us a, a, a set of uh, panelists who have contributed uh, to the IPCC process, um, in particular to the, uh, to the three reports, as well as the, uh, the revised uh, Good Practice Guidelines published in 2019. And we have uh, Dr. Felipe Garcia Oliva, Dr. Werner Kurtz, Dr. Ted Schur, Dr. Elena Shevlyakova and Dr. Pam McAway. Um, in 2018 and 2000, in 2018 and 2019, the, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published a uh, series of special reports. The first focusing on uh, the one and a half degree target, and the second focusing on the uh, the special report on climate change and land, and uh, the third on the special report on oceans and cryosphere. These special reports are uh, in, in a line of uh, previous special reports that are associated with the assessment report process. Uh, the IPCC was established in 1988 by the United Nations Environmental Program and the World Meteorological Organization. And uh, since 1988 has published uh, five reports and is in the middle of uh, reviewing uh, the, the sixth uh, assessment report. And so we are we're keen to um, sort of hear the experiences of uh, people that have been involved in uh, putting together the reports. And we've asked them a set of questions, uh, first to introduce themselves and their role in the IPCC. Uh, second, to uh, give their perspective on, on why the uh, IPCC special report that they contributed to exists. Uh, what were the key findings of that report? And how are these findings used in the context of the North American Carbon Program activities? Uh, and we hope um, that we have uh, some, some questions coming in from the audience that we can get to, and that uh, this panel provides an opportunity uh, for, for people to learn how to become engaged, uh, either scientifically or as a reviewer or as a stakeholder in the IPCC process. So our first uh, panelist will be uh, Dr. Felipe Garcia Oliver. Thank you very much, Ben, and Ceci for the invitation. I am Felipe Garcia Oliva from the University of Mexico, and I participate as a lead author in the IPCC Special Report Climate Change and Land. Next, Ben, please. The main objective of this report is to analyze interdisciplinary interaction among climate change, land degradation, and food security, as well as adaptation and mitigation response option based in sustainable land management. The main finding was the dry land water scarcity, wildfire damage, permafrost degradation, and food supply instabilities are the most vulnerable land based process by increase of global mean surface temperature. I consider that the link between North American Carbon Program and this special report is the link between adaptation and mitigation response option with other ecosystem services as biodiversity, water security, human well-being, on their sustainability land management. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, our next uh, panelist is, is Dr. Werner Kurtz. 
Thank you, Ben, and thank you to the organizers for this opportunity. Um, I'm Verna Kurtz. I'm a senior research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service of Natural Resources Canada, and I live in Victoria, British Columbia. I've been involved in the IPCC over the last 20 plus years. Um, I have been lead author of two of the special reports that were identified uh, by Ben and that we're discussing today. Over these 20 years, I've seen significant changes in the work that the IPCC has done and the impacts it has. I think it is fair to say that the impacts of our reports have significantly increased, but so has the scrutiny associated with these reports. And one of the things that uh, is really important is that we understand that the process involves three versions, at least, of, of each report, and that each of these ver versions receives thousands and thousands of review comments. The number has dramatically increased over the last years, and it is necessary for the authors to respond in writing to every review comment received, and these entire collection of comments and responses are part of the documentation that makes these uh, reports both transparent and the process transparent and their impact so high. Next slide, please. The first of the two reports that I will speak briefly to is the special report on climate change and land. This is a synthesis and an assessment. And by assessment, I mean an assessment of the agreement among the scientists and the likelihood of outcomes. And that is what makes IPCC reports so unique and special because they are also involving a process by which scientists evaluate, not only read and review, but evaluate and assess the science uh, that flows into these reports. So the special report on climate change is a synthesis and assessment of the opportunities and the risks of land sector based contribution towards the pathways towards 1.5 degrees. And the report was in part asked for to add a perspective to the special report on 1.5 degrees, which focused primarily on how do we get there? And this report is focusing very much on the land sector contributions. The report covers a wide range of topics as uh, a chapters on desertification, land degradation, food security, and mitigation options. And of course, everybody would highlight different important messages coming out of it. For me, what was really important was the highlighting of the uncertainty, uh, as well as the importance of understanding the local and regional conditions and responses, and the need to consider these when we develop mitigation policies and try to scale these up to the globe. As far as the NACP research is concerned, I think the biggest needs continue to be research on all aspects of land management opportunities that allow us to enhance and ultimately also sustain land SIGs and the impacts and risks associated with climate change impacts on these land SIGs. Next slide, please. The second report that came out by the Task Force on Greenhouse Gas Inventories is the refinement to the IPCC 2006 guidelines. The mandate here, and this was a very political and therefore complicated process, was to update and supplement and or elaborate the 2006 IPCC guidelines where gaps existed or where out of date signs has been identified. This was an enormous progress uh, process. The 2006 guidelines uh, consist of five volumes for five different sectors, the land sector only being one of them. And the intent was to augment, but not to replace the guidelines, which means users now have to use the two documents together. It's important for us to remember that these IPCC guidelines are the foundation for achieving transparency, consistency, comparability, completeness, and accuracy of national greenhouse gas inventories. Um, and these are therefore uh, the foundation for the assessment of progress towards greenhouse gas emission reductions in the land sector and, and in all its sectors, and ultimately also will help inform the global stock take in 2023. As far as NACP research is con concerned, from my perspective, perhaps the biggest needs in the land sector remain to better understand the responses of soils and dead organic matter pools, including permafrost, to land management and climate change. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Verna. 
Uh, uh, next is uh, Dr. Ted Schur. Hi, everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear my audio. Apologies for my um, slow internet if you can't see my video. Um, my name is Ted Schur. I'm a professor at Northern Arizona University in the Center for Ecosystem Science and Society. And um, I guess I'm going to add a little bit of comment on um, the special report and um, just to give a context for the Oceans in Christ report that I was a part of. It was uh, 100 authors from 36 countries. It contains and reviewed over 7,000 peer reviewed publications and there were over 30,000 comments that were received during the review process. And so it's quite comprehensive. One point that was mentioned, but I'd like to reiterate is that the special reports are different than the assessment reports. Um, there's the three working groups of IPCC and the special reports were meant to link across working groups. So for the SROC, the special report I was a part of, um, it linked across working group one, which is the physical and natural sciences of climate, climate change, and working group two, which is the impact and responses to climate change. So in that way, it's different than the assessment report six that's going to be published in the next year. So it's a unique voice and the special report should be viewed as such. Um, there is <laughs> One thing I wanted to say to the science community is that these reports contain a lot of information and what makes it to the media is usually highlighted in the summary for policymakers. But I do encourage other scientists to dive back into the reports themselves. There's a lot of interesting information in there. And I'd point out a couple things to look at if you are a scientist. First of all, um, I mentioned there are 7,000 peer reviewed publications that are cited. Now, this is not a review and so these are kind of curated publications. They're the ones that are thought by the community to be the most important. So I think if you're studying a topic, it's a great place to start as a, as a list of curated citations. And then the second aspect of, the, of all the IPCC reports is the uncertainty language where authors, co-authors, and the review process evaluate the, not the scientific knowledge on particular topics. And that's the language of um, likely um, very likely things that you see throughout the IPCC report, but can help you understand the state of the science at a particular subject. Now, it's hard to encompass everything that's in a single report. So I thought for the NACP community that I would focus on the main findings in relation to permafrost carbon. So that's my own study subject, but I'm also the lead of the permafrost carbon network, which synthesizes information and brought that both to the IPCC and also to the NACP. Ben, can you go ahead with the next Slide, please. Um, hopefully you guys are seeing the bullet points. Um, again, just focusing in here on some of the main findings and gaps. Um, I've, I put down for permafrost carbon, some of the findings there for projections. So thinking about future, those are the top bullet points. And then the bottom bullet points are the current observations. And so I also color coded some of the IPCC uncertainty language to give you a sense of where we are with the state of knowledge. So the first bullet point, uh, we project widespread permafrost thaw. That's something with very high confidence. That's a changing cryosphere. We know things are getting warmer. We're gonna lose permafrost. The second bullet point looks at the release of carbon as both carbon dioxide and methane. So under an RCP 8.5 scenario, kind of emissions that are unmitigated, we are releasing tens to hundreds of billions of tons of additional permafrost carbon to the atmosphere. You can see that's orange, that's medium confidence, and you can see there's quite a wide range from tens to hundreds, so there's still a lot of science to be done there. The third bullet point says that if we reduce emissions, if we follow other RCPs, um, it's likely that we will dampen the response of carbon emissions from the permafrost region. So we know that if we reduce human greenhouse gas emissions, will slow climate change and this will slow changes in the Arctic. And then the last bullet point is important because we think that the, the Arctic or we know that the Arctic is getting greener, we expect this to, to happen. This um, is offsetting permafrost carbon release by taking up carbon into biomass. Um, we only have a medium confidence in this. So this is a place where new science is needed. Um, models do project that plants are gonna offset much of permafrost carbon release, but this isn't always matched by observations. Um, I wanna look at the bottom um, bullet points, the 
observation. So this is what's happening now. Again, with permafrost temperature and thaw, we um, our networks are showing that we are losing permafrost right now. We have very high confidence in that. In fact, um, we hear often about um, sea ice hitting minimum conditions. The same thing is happening with permafrost temperatures. They're at record highs. Um, we know well that there is a lot of uh, organic carbon stored frozen in permafrost. Um, I put a medium confidence there. It's both orange and green because we're, we're quite certain about this for the surface three meters of soil. We also know there's organic carbon at depth, which we have fewer measurements, but the more we make, the more carbon we seem to find. And then finally, I'll just hit that last point um, that says medium evidence with low agreement whether northern permafrost regions are currently releasing additional net carbon dioxide and methane due to thaw. This is the big question. Is this already happening? So this is colored orange and red. And the orange says that we've spent 10 years studying this. So the NACP program and other programs have focused in on these additional carbon emissions, but due to the remote location and the and the, and the difficulty of sampling, a lot of our new knowledge doesn't all give us one single answer. That's the low agreement. So there's still science to be done here. My personal opinion is that these emissions are already underway, and we know that from well-documented places like Alaska, but we also recognize there's other places in the Arctic that are not as sampled and our uncertainty is lower. So I will end with that and hand it back to Ben. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Ted. And um, our next panelist is uh, Dr. Lena Shevlikova. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to share my experience as a convenient lead author for Chapter 2 in the Special Land Report. I uh, also would like to acknowledge my lead authors, shown there in the middle picture, and also dozens of contributing authors who, without whom this report wouldn't be possible. I also would like to remind again that the full title is quite long and the reason actually because this report came about for, as a response to five different proposals submitted by different countries. So that's why the title is so long. And the question is why do we have this first report has an answer in its title. It's because country wants to know that information. And the different countries have different emphasis. That's why the title has all these diverse uh, topics and subjects. So we also would like to, I would also would like you to know that what's in the report is not an arbitrary or sort of choice of uh, topics or subjects by the lead authors or even by PCC. What goes into report is agreed in a special scoping sections, uh, sessions devised by more than 100 scientists and representatives of different governments and different organizations. And this particular report, in addition to the three working groups, has a large contribution of experts from the Task Force on National Greenhouse Gas Inventories, which play a very important role in IPCC. And once you have a report ready, then there is a special uh, summary called uh, summary for policymakers is written by a subgroup of co-authors, then, then later is approved in a special session with the member states and line by line. And that's the last picture you see in, in the report. So in that sense, special reports go through the same rigorous scrutiny as the regular reports, and they also have the summary for policymakers approved by the both by both scientists and by the government. So next slide. So I would like to focus on some findings from chapter two, because overall land report was very diverse. And also I would like you to know that when we say main findings, what makes into summary for policymakers, it's the findings which are known to be, uh, have high confidence or the moderate confidence. And what it means, there's a large number of publications, observations, modeling results, and reports which support that particular finding, and there is a large agreement between them. So if you want to find out things which tell you about the gaps or the missing processes or the missing results, you really need to go into chapters themselves, because traditionally those are not elevated to the main findings. So in chapter two, we have a range of different findings, and one which is very, sounds like simple, but it was a surprise to many 
policymakers and the scientists that land warms nearly twice as much as global mean. Like global mean is a typical metric for the working group one reports throughout the whole history of IPCC. What it means that by the time, even if we stabilize climate at 1.5 degree or two degrees, on average, land's gonna be already three degrees to four degrees warmer than its pre-industrial state. That it means that land's gonna experience a large fraction of warming and in some regions of the world, particularly in the Arctic, which Ted spoke about, the warming is going to be even higher. So another example of the main message, which come out both in the special land report and is going to come out in uh, uh, working group one report, is land remains a sink of CO2. Over the last decade, about 11 gigatons of carbon of CO2 was removed by the land. And you can see it on the second picture on the left, that's a little gray bar. But if you look at the right side of that graph, which is in our chapter, you see these two large brownish bars. Those are the net sinks by, due to environmental changes by the uh, land and net sources. And you can see those tiny little question marks. We tried to make them bigger, but the artists at the IPCC somehow keep trying to make them smaller. What we, what we said in that chapter, which never made in the key message, is that we don't actually know the gross sinks and gross sources on the land side. And there is very significant uncertainty about them. And more so, the models which are used like in the projects like Carbon Global Carbon Project also have large uncertainty about growth sinks and gross sources. It's an example of the uh, issue which NACP could really contribute a lot and reduce those uncertainty. We also have a section in the chapter two which specifically talks about gaps in uh, uh, models and missing processes and land climate interactions. And those models are often used to project both the future climate changes up to 2100, like Earth system models, and also future sinks and sources. That's an example where we could actually specifically look at those process understanding, think about observational campaigns, and think about the studies we need to do to reduce those uncertainties. But in my mind, one of the main findings which come out of the land report that in order for us to limit global warming and provide those sinks of the carbon, you know, we need to convert large areas of land to forest and also use them for bioenergy crops. While it's understood that it's required, it's not very well understood what are the implications for the regional climate and whether those conversions are going to be sustainable and, and, and if they will provide those sinks anti changing climate because change, climate will continue to change. Another thing which we thought important in chapter two, and which to my you know, knowledge, still one of the major uncertainties and projections of carbon sinks, what is the effect of CO2 fertilization? We have a situation where every ESM has a huge carbon sink due to the fertilization, but we can find that in the plot studies or the inventories. So another interesting thing is there is a big discrepancy between the sinks provided by the global carbon project and what the inventories from the countries estimate. So we need to reconcile those differences because you cannot have different methods giving you the different uh, sinks and sources estimates. We should build upon experiences and findings with, of reports which NACP contributed, like as our car state of the carbon cycle report and the national climate assessments. While we need the IPCC reports, I think if I want to influence national policies and the national decision making, I think national climate assessments provide very unique and very powerful opportunity to affect what's happening in North America. So you need to do both. You need to participate in IPCC, but you also have to prioritize and maybe even put more priorities on the national assessment. And I think the quality of carbon budgets in the second report, which Ben, I think, was one of the co-authors, was actually better and higher than what we had for the global carbon budget in my report and my chapter, because it has more detail, more information. So we could do both. So we also, since March is a Women's History Month, it's my last message, I think we need to improve climate for women in climate science. In IPCC, even in IR6, Women climate scientists represent only 33% of offers. We need to increase diversity. We need to encourage uh, 
all different types of scientists to apply both to be the IPCC offers in national climate assessments and other reports. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elena. And um, our, our final panelist is Dr. Pam McElwee from uh, Rutgers University. And uh, hopefully you're putting your questions in in the Slido and, and Ceci will be um, uh, moderating those after Pam's uh, presentation. Great. Thanks so much, Ben. Uh, cognizant of time and, and being the last person who also worked on the land report, I don't want to repeat what my fellow authors said, but maybe um, point out a few um, new aspects, particularly because um, I'm coming at this from more of a social science angle. Uh, and so I was on a different chapter than our previous speakers, um, one that was particularly focused on adaptation and mitigation options in the land sector and the degree to which we can potentially rely on the land sector um, to get us mitigation goals. Um, and we raised a number of questions there um, that I want to mention. Um, I do want to echo what uh, was previously said about this being a very complicated report. It was a very political report um, because it was a an attempt to address a lot of developing country concerns, um, particularly around uh, land degradation and the impacts of, of climate on the land sector in developing countries. Um, and so it's interesting to note actually that the report author team for the first time um, of any IPCC report was a majority of authors from developing countries. So 53% of the authors were from developing countries. Um, and hopefully that's a trend that will continue, particularly on special reports like this that are so crucial to understanding um, what the future holds in terms of adaptation um, for developing countries. Um, and then to echo Elena's comment uh, about the need to uh, encourage women to be part of these as well, um, the land report also was a high water mark for um, female lead authors and coordinating lead authors. So 40% of the coordinating lead authors um, were female for that report. So the coordinating lead authors are the chapter leads. Um, and so, uh, you know, not quite parity, but, but getting close there. And, and Elena's picture that she showed in her last um, slide uh, was the very end of the meeting um, where we had been going for 24 hours straight to approve this report, which is not unusual in, in recent reports. Um, and at, at one point, all of the scientists on the stage uh, were women. And so um, Valerie Masson uh, Delight, who is the uh, working group two uh, uh, co-chair, uh, was in the audience and taking pictures and saying, I think this is the first time I've ever seen all women up there um, uh, trying to get this report pushed through. So uh, we need more women, encourage more folks to do that. We also need more social scientists. Um, and so that's why I'm really happy to um, talk today about the role of social science in particular here. Um, and I think it's particularly crucial um, for the carbon community to think about the, the role social science can play in these reports um, around carbon management, because that's a human centered um, policy relevant sector that's going to be absolutely crucial to see if we meet our um, uh, long term goals under the Paris Agreement. So I would I would highlight the three high level messages from the report um, having to do with decision making and policy. Um, the first being that land is under growing pressure, um, given that we know that human use is affecting more than 70% of the global land surface. Um, and so any climate impacts that are reverberating um, into those terrestrial ecosystems are going to be affecting things like food production, ecosystem services use, um, all of which have direct development impacts on people. Um, secondly, the land report was very clear that land can be part of the solution. Um, there are lots of options to improve better land stewardship, sustainable land management, and reduced emissions from multiple sectors, agriculture, forestry, coastal areas, um, but land can't do it all. And so that was really a really important message because there had been some, some recent um, studies in the last couple of years that left the impression that if we just plant a bunch of trees, um, we can sort of plant our way out of this problem. And the land report was very clear that the land sector is not a get out of jail free card, um, that you cannot just focus on the land sector um, because there are so many competing um, uses for land. And so it can't just be a carbon store. Um, and we need to make dramatic reductions in fossil fuel emissions um, and not just rely on the land sector itself. So in terms of what those gaps are for policymaking and where the, the North American um, Carbon Program can really contribute, um, for me, the really important issues were related to sustainability trade-offs. 
So where are those most pressing? You know, where do we have those conflicts between, say, food production uh, and afforestation? Where are the most serious risks of inaction? So given finite resources, you know, what do we need to concentrate on? Um, try to get away from win-win narratives. Uh, I think that's why there was so much attention to tree planting as a panacea. It, it, it appeared to be win-win. But you know, if you're not, say, doing agroforestry and you're displacing food production, that's a serious risk for, for numerous developing countries. Um, and that's why I think interdisciplinary teams are, are absolutely crucial to addressing a lot of these management questions. Um, and for me, there's a lot of talk about nature-based solutions right now. It's really popular. It's a new um, focus of a lot of attention. Um, and I think what we as the, the carbon community can do is talk about, you know, where are their limits, where are their roadblocks, where are their barriers. Again, it's not a silver bullet. Um, where is it most effective? Do we prioritize high carbon ecosystems? Do we prior prioritize place where we can get multiple co-benefits? How do we do this? Um, so I'll leave it there and, and look forward to questions. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Um... Uh, that 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 was great. It was it was really valuable to get the different perspectives in terms of uh, how you all contributed as well as participated in um, in, uh, in in the IPCC special reports. Um, I one one question I have as as we sort of make the transition is to sort of build off of the comments that uh, both Elena and, and Pam uh, mentioned on uh, increasing diversity in the IPCC process. And I suppose uh, maybe starting with Elena, if you could explain a bit about how. Uh, people can become involved in in the process or or how you became involved in the process well i think one thing is the easiest thing to do is become expert reviewer because anybody who works in any scientific organization can sign up and i think that's the most you know easiest and probably the first way you could affect what the reports are then I think you could nominate people can be nominated by their university people can be nominated by their research labs, but you also can nominate yourself. So I think you just need to be proactive in doing that and maybe approach your, you know, people who supervise you or people who lab directors or chairs or just put your name out there in community. So in that sense, it's pretty easy. And then from there, USGCRP picks people who, you know, they consider representing well US, for example, and then committee at IPCC picks the people. So, but I think like being proactive is the first step. Thank you, Elena, and thank you all for these uh, uh, recent presentations. We have two questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is an anonymous question. It says, what is the global stock take for 2023 referred to by Werner? Yeah, thank you for the question. The global stock take is one of the elements of the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement uh, countries made commitments to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions into the future, and they quantify these commitments through their nationally determined contributions. So these are submissions that outline their intent for how they will reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the future. The global stock take will be the first assessment. Uh, these are supposed to happen every five years. First one will be in 2023, in which the global community will seek to assess progress uh, with regard to changes in the atmospheric composition of greenhouse gases. The modalities for how this will be done, the underlying science that will be used are yet to be determined. But one of the key things that we need to all be aware of is that there is a huge discrepancy still between the sum of the national greenhouse gas inventories and the scientific estimates of composition changes in the atmosphere. And the reason for that are twofold. One is the national greenhouse gas inventories are only supposed to report on the anthropogenic emissions and removals in the land sector and, and, and in other sectors. And so there are elements of the response of the terrestrial ecosystems that are not captured in the greenhouse gas inventories because they're due to uh, processes in unmanaged lands or, or uh, natural processes. And so, as Elena already highlighted also, there are still huge uncertainties about the gross fluxes. And so there, a lot of science effort will be required in two areas. One, we need to bring our two communities, those that work on the greenhouse gas inventories and those that work on the carbon estimates, we need to bring us closer together. There's a huge effort uh, underway, uh, Giacomo Grassi and 
Joe House and I and others have been involved in, in publishing some papers that address these gaps. And our communities need to work more closely together, understand better why we have these discrepancies. Uh, there's not nothing nefarious going on here. These are you know, not people or, or countries playing games. It's just the consequences of how the reporting is supposed to be done. And the global stock take is intended to measure progress towards the targets as the atmosphere sees it. I hope that was a short synopsis. <laughs> Thank you, Werner. Uh, the second one is, uh, is there a scientific influence uh, or should we, as scientists, try to influence the question, is each country sent for special assessments? I can, I can take a stab at that. Um, you know, the, the IPCC is is quite unique in that it is a science policy organization. So obviously it tries to generate the best possible science, but there is a policy and political element and that's what makes its recommendation so strong. So I don't think we should shy away from understanding that political side, that it is governments that go to these plenaries and, and approve these reports. And of course, they're going to bring particular agendas with them. That's the nature of politics. Um, but it's science and politics together. And so you might get a country that really wants to emphasize um, a particular aspect in a report, but if the science doesn't support that assertion, then the scientists are there to push back and say, you know, we cannot say that in the report because it's it's not, not backed up by science. Um, so it's an iterative process, um, you know, and sometimes it's, it's very minor things like terminology, certain countries like one terminology over another. Um, I remember one country, for example, doesn't didn't like saying uh, saying ecosystem services, but they wanted ecosystem services and functions because they felt like services was too um, anthropocentric. So th those sorts of things happen, and I think it was a better report for acknowledging that functions are an important part of of ecosystem services. So that that iteration, I think, is inevitable, um, and I think it's what gives IPCC its strength as well. Lena. Uh, in terms of asking new questions, I think scientists and countries have a lot of way to promote special reports with specific focus. Because last time when IPCC requested proposals, some countries had three, four proposals, US had only one on cryosphere. So maybe we as a North American Carbon Project can think about important topics which we would like special reports to take up on. And those topics could be then, you know, communicated to USGCRP. And those type of questions then could become special reports. So in some sense, there is a bottom-up process to elevate a question. And I think that's what an ACP should have the eyes open for when they're asking those questions. And we could put up those pr proposals out. Excellent, thanks. Also, I believe that uh, countries, economies, they all depend on uh, the environment. So we need to be integrated and help them make uh, informed decisions. So I think that is uh, our main job as a scientist. Uh, we have one last question. Uh, uh, restrictions in the use of great literature can be causing bias in the information that is assessed. What is your opinion? Who wants to take that one? Maybe I can say something to that since um, I haven't responded. Um, there is there are strict um, rules about uh, peer reviewed publications and that those publications be made available. And so I do believe with some gray literature, it is possible to be cited as long as those documents can be put into the repository and found. So it's not quite a black and white, but it is important for the community to understand that there are cutoff dates for publications and so in, in the case of the SROC, when it, which was published in 2019, there's a cutoff date, you know, at least six months before that, where a peer reviewed publication must be um, accepted. And so we kind of have to work with those guidelines because I think the foundation to the science that we're permit, presenting is that it's accessible, transparent and communicated um, through the peer review process. Um, I, I can hand that over to any colleagues that wanna go further, but I don't think we lose too much information from the gray literature if it is known by a scientist working on the report. Thanks.
Thank you. That is the questions we have from the audience. Uh, remember, if you have more questions, send them and uh, we'll have them answer uh, via other way or uh, the web page. We go uh, to them. Ceci, there was one more question in the audience uh, there that I just approved. Also, Ceci, it is uh, do all nomination for IPCC authorships have to go through national government selection? For example, uh, US GCRP, or if yes, uh, how does that help with improving diversity? Since we're running out of time, we might need to um, find out information about that and, and uh, get back to folks. Okay. We can we can we can do that and, and um, unless someone has a quick answer, but well, I think yeah. there were more people nominated in the base pool. The more USGCRP has to choose from. So if there are not many nominations come to USGCRP, they cannot make up the numbers, right? So I think the key is just to be proactive and get your name if you want to be part of it. Yeah, and I, and I want to say one 10 second thing, which is to um, echo Elena and Pam earlier about representation in the IPCC. And, and I think it's important for the audience to know that there is um, interest and recognition at IPCC to increase diversity, increase um, gender diversity, increase um, indigenous and traditional knowledge. And so um, it's a long path, that, but they are on that path. And so like Elena mentioned, the more um, people step forward, the more they can um, continue on that path. So. I think they're making progress and more is to be done. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks, Ted. And uh, thank, thank you so much to the panel. Um, it's, it's great that we were able to um, finally get everyone together and discuss this topic and, and sort of share experiences and, and, and knowledge relative to the special reports. Um, and thank you everyone for joining online. And uh, now there'll be a five minute break and um, uh, reconvening at 125 uh, for the next session.
Welcome back everyone. Now we are going to hear some talks from the next uh, organized science session. This is actually a combination of two sessions that we had solicited abstracts for. Uh, next generation data management syntheses and products, as well as from, a, uh, from manipulative experiments to models and back. So hang tight. In this talk, I will discuss the evaluation of simulated soil carbon dynamics within, within the Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment, or above domain, using an ensemble of process-based terrestrial biogeochemistry models. Theoretically, soil carbon dynamics can be predicted given knowledge of the size of initial carbon pools, as well as information about carbon input rates, residence time of carbon in soil pools, and the sensitivity of that stored carbon to environmental factors. However, results from numerous studies have showed widely different estimates of, across models, and these differences have not been well constrained by most conventional be benchmarks, at least not to date. A key challenge in modeling or model benchmarking is confronting models with observations that not only tell us whether models produce the right endpoints, such as the magnitude of soil carbon pools, but also if they simulate the correct pathways to those endpoints, such as the response of soil respiration to climate warming. Endpoints are critical for robust and reliable predictions of how much carbon is or has the potential to be stored within a given ecosystem. And pathways are critical for predicting the vulnerability of that stored carbon and improving the integrity of future projections over time. We will look at model simulated soil carbon stocks and turnover rates as well as the relationship between soil carbon loss and soil temperature in the above domain using simulation results from MISTIMIP or the Multiscale Synthesis and Terrestrial Model Intercomparison Project. Um, in this analysis, we use a tiered approach to evaluate models. First, we compare large-scale state estimates, like the magnitude of soil carbon stocks, to available observationally based estimates. Then we examine the sensitivity of both modeled soil carbon stocks and fluxes to environmental forcing factors like climate and atmosphere CO2. And then finally, we evaluate model simulated relationships of transient soil carbon loss um, as a function of soil temperature across a range of temperature values. What we find is that models exhibit an order of magnitude difference in estimates of current total soil carbon stocks within the above domain. In this figure, the black circles are the modeled estimates and the solid vertical black line is the observational estimate of soil carbon stocks from the Northern Circumpolar Soil Carbon Database uh, for the full above domain. And while the observational based estimate falls within the spread of model results, model performance against this benchmark is relatively poor, with over half the models significantly under or over predicting the amount of soil carbon stored within the top one meter. For most models in the ensemble, performance against the benchmark improves significantly if permafrost and peatland dominated regions are removed from the analysis. And this is represented by the asterisk here for the models and the vertical dashed line for the benchmark. And this is not surprising since most models do not explicitly model peatlands and many models do not have vertically resolved soil biogeochemistry, which is needed to accurately simulate permafrost dynamics. We find that the magnitude of so total soil carbon stocks at steady state or at the start of the transient simulations is the prime driver in the divergence in model estimates of total soil carbon stocks um, at the end of simulations. And we can see this in the near one-to-one -one relationship of soil carbon stocks at steady state versus the size of stocks at the end of transient runs across the ensemble of models. This is true not only for soil carbon, but also for above ground biomass or live biomass and for soil carbon losses through respiration and soil carbon inputs through productivity. In fact, the influence of steady state conditions on pool and flux size, that gray bar in this figures, these figures overwhelms the effect of environmental forcing factors, the colored bars, over the 110 year simulation period. Across the ensemble, however, models do indicate an acceleration of soil carbon cycling within the, above, within the above domain. This is seen through a decrease in the inferred soil carbon residence time um, in that top right box. We also see an acceleration of soil carbon cycling over time by an increase in the magnitude or the rate of 
productivity and respiration relative to initial conditions at the start of simulation. Um, across the ensemble, the prime driver for the acceleration of soil carbon cycling appears to be climate, followed by rising atmospheric CO2. However, the relative contributions of each varies across significantly across models. We also evaluated model sensitivity of soil carbon losses or respiration to changing temperature compared to relationships derived from observational studies for both boreal and northern shrubland ecosystems. And this is shown in the top panel of this figure. From these curves, we extracted an inferred Q10 for each model, which indicates the sensitivity of respiration to a 10 degree change or 10 degrees Celsius change in temperature and this is shown in the bottom panel. Uh, two groups of models emerge here. Um, those with an inferred Q10 that is about half of what observations suggest and another group of models with an inferred Q10 that is comparable to observations. Interestingly, models that perform better against observational constraints of model endpoints, like soil, carbon stock, and fluxes, do not necessarily perform better against observational constraints on the pathways to those endpoints, or the response of respiration to temperature. In fact, the reverse tends to be true. Models that show weaker sensitivity to heterotrophic respiration, or heterotrophic re respiration to temperature, tend to perform better in their estimates of soil carbon stocks, such as Orchidae and Vegas. This suggests that some models may be getting the right endpoints, but for the wrong reasons. And it could also mean that the observational constraints themselves might be insufficient to probably, properly assess model performance. The results of this work point to the need to constrain initial co carbon stocks or carbon pools in models. And we found that models' initial carbon stocks at steady state um, were the prime determinant of the model's simulated contemporary or future state. And given the importance of steady state conditions, a foundational first step then needs to be to reduce model uncertainty in simulated soil carbon dynamics by constraining those steady state carbon pool sizes and models. This work also shows how derived benchmarks such as respiration loss with temperature can help evaluate model pathways to determine if models are getting the right answer for the right reason. And this type of analysis is important for informing model development and improving the integrity of projections of future climate change in states. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Richard Lay from Penn State. Today I will present our research on the potential and the limits of all CO2 satellites on detecting long-term fossil fuel CO2 emission trend over urban areas. Urban areas get more than 50% population and more than 70% fossil fuel CO2 emissions in the world. Thus, accurate quantification of fossil fuel CO2 emissions from urban areas is of great importance to formulation of global warming mitigation policies to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Satellites potentially allow us track and monitor fossil fuel emission changes over urban areas globally. However, its accuracy is still limited by incomplete background information, cloud blockages, aerosol contaminations, and uh, uncertainties of models and prior. Thus, the potential and the limits of satellites on detecting fossil fuel CO2 emissions from cities are worth of investigation. But it's rarely studied over the long term and across the global. That's why we want to fill the gap with our study. We try to answer these three questions. At first, how many high-quality satellite tracks are available over the urban areas and why some tracks last? Second, can also two quality flags effectively filter out low-quality soundings at the city level? At last, are high-quality tracks enough to capture the long-term fossil fuel CO2 emission trend? To answer the first question, we scan all OCO2 satellite tracks over the most populated 70 cities up to the end of 2019 and calculated the ratios of high quality soundings marked by OCO2 quality flags. These figures show the percentages of high quality OCO2 soundings over the 70 cities. Considering that the city will vary by size, we calculated the ratio in box with 25, 50, 75, 100, 200 kilometer border to center distance. Overall, the percentage stays around 17% as the box size increases. The ratios of high quality sounding in America and Africa are a little higher than other continents. Given the 16 day OCO2 re revisiting period, three to four tracks per year are high quality tracks for each city uh, on average. 
we also studied the reasons for data loss by examining the OCO2 quality flags and found that clouds and aerosols are two major reasons. To answer the other two questions, we need to use atmospheric models limited by computational resources. Here, we selected the second largest city in Pakistan, Lahore, for the case study. It has a faster growing economy and the population of booming in recent two decades. It's flat topography and the faster increasing fossil fuel CO2 emissions make it a ideal test bed for demonstrating the capability of fossil fuel CO2 emission trend detection from space. We chose 25 OCO2 tracks or Lahore. Each track contains more than 150 uh, soundings that evenly distribute along the track. All tracks are at the downwind direction and show clear XCO2 enhancements. Here we present a sample of OCO2 track. In the right figures, the upper one shows that the track is downwind of Lahore. The lower one shows that a clear XCO2 enhancement peak in the middle of the track. If just considering high quality soundings, available tracks become less. Only eight out of 25 tracks fit the above criteria. Here is how we validate if OCO2 quality flags can effectively felt out low quality soundings at the city level. Because lack of in-situ in CO2 data, we the simulated the fossil fuel CO2 using three independent approaches, Wolfcam, XDL, and the flux cross-sectional integration method to ensure result robustness. The comparison of satellite to car reference ratio is shown in this figure. We chose to show ratios, not the difference here, because we want to estimate the fossil fuel CO2 emissions at the next step. The emission estimation is based on ratios, not the differences. We can see that the ratios of high quality tracks show as blue bus converge closer to one compared to the all data tracks show as red bus. Thus, OCO2 quality flags are useful filters of low quality OCO2 retrievals producing unlikely emission values over the whole, although they were originally designed for global studies. Hence, only high quality tracks should be considered in the following study. In the end, we calculated the trend of posterior fossil fuel CO2 emissions over Lahore using variation inversion based on the eight high quality tracks at multiple uncertainty levels. The posterior fossil fuel CO2 emissions over Lahore show an annual 6.7% increasing trend. We believe this is the first CO2 emission trend result based on our CO2 satellite. To test the significance of the trends, we calculated the significant possibility at 95 significant levels of McIndale upward trend test using 10,000 Monte Carlo simulations. The significant possibility increases as the prior uncertainty decreases, while it decreases as observation uncertainty decreases. Observational uh, uncertainty is related to the model and the satellite. It implies that the trend is driven by the prior, not the optimized emissions based on the OCO2 satellite data at the current stage. The situation might improve if we have more high quality tracks. Here are the conclusions. About 70% 17% of OCO2 soundings are marked as high quality soundings by quality flags over the global most populated 70 cities, which means that there are three to four high quality tracks per year over cities on average. Cloud and aerosol issues are two major reasons for data loss. OCO2 quality flags are useful filters of low quality OCO2 retrievals, although they were originally designed for global studies. Bayesian inversion shows an annual 6.7% increase in trend of fossil fuel CO2 emissions over Lahore, but the trend is driven by the prior, not the, the optimized emissions based on CO2 satellite data because of the limited number of high quality tracks. Thanks for your attention. And uh, we also want to thank for funding from NASA, France, and help from guys in Caltech and uh, JPL. Hello, everyone. My name is Alta Foren. I'm a professor at McMaster University, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Today, I will be talking about 
development of an integrated eco hydrological modeling system mesh system over the past few decades uh, much progress have been made in the development of hydrological models similarly the land surface schemes have evolved and many developments have made in uh, these land surface schemes however there are few examples where we have these integrated hydrological and biogeochemical uh, models uh, in the literature so if you want to study the hydrological and biogeochemical processes at the catchment scale we have uh, to integrate these models uh, for these studies the objective of this work is to develop an integrated biogeochemical and hydrologic modeling system that can be applied at the catchment scale for this purpose we coupled canadian land surface scheme and the canadian terrestrial ecosystem model in the mesh hydrologic modeling system mesh is an operational hydrologic modeling system that is used by government agencies in canada class and ctam models are used in canadian regional and global climate models uh, this coupling will provide us robust canopy conductance formulation sloped land surface distributed river flow routing variable soil depth and organic layer weighted distribution of plant functional types dynamic vegetation capabilities and the plant and soil nitrogen cycling this work is being built on our past modeling efforts where we have developed carbon and nitrogen coupled class and ctam models we have applied these models at the site regional and global scales and we also participated in nacp and lba initiatives uh, in this study we have applied this model to two watersheds big creek and then we are in process of applying it into the uh, hudson bay lowland in many uh, watersheds ideally it should be applied to the other watersheds where we have the flux data available the big creek watershed is a small watershed that is located in the backyard of our flux tower stations uh, at the turkey point observatory uh, near the lake erie so we started with this watershed because we had a lot of data available uh, for this region this slide shows the comparison between energy fluxes observed from the mesh class default model and the mesh uh, system model for the forest sites as well as uh, the simulation for the crop and the grassland site where we had uh, limited data sets it shows small improvement using the mesh system model but overall simulations uh, are acceptable uh, here we see the stream flow uh, for the big creek uh, where we see the reasonably well uh, simulation from the model however model is missing some very large peaks the carbon fluxes were pretty nice pretty robust for the forested sites so this gives us the simulation from the conifer and the deciduous sites and this slide here shows us the catchment scale uh, energy and water fluxes for each grid and also the aggregate and the uh, and the carbon fluxes uh, gp re and nep from the model then we applied this model we are in process of this this is ongoing work for the hudson bay lowland uh, region here only the mesh class simulations were made uh, not the carbon simulations so this is the groundhog river flux site and the stream flow simulations are uh, pretty uh, nice for the two periods and this is for the two watersheds the model performed pretty well for uh, this region and what model was here model was able to pick the large peaks uh, in the stream flow uh, as well uh, this graph here shows us the uh, for the different periods uh, the stream flow in the simulation 
a steam flow simulation in the Hudson Bay uh, area. So it shows us the high precipitation between 1995 to 2008 uh, period. This high precipitation was uh, because of the negative Pacific decadal oscillation and also the uh, Atlantic multidecadal oscillations. Because of these two oscillations, this period had high precipitation values and the high steam flow. After this period, this precipitation became normal, but the high uh, steam flows continued uh, in this re uh, region after uh, this period. So we uh, think that this is because of the permafrost uh, de degradation, and this paper has been uh, submitted. Uh, in conclusion, we saw very small improvements in energy and water fluxes. However, uh, carbon fluxes were well simulated model underestimated extreme precipitation events. In northern watersheds, the steam flow was well simulated. The study helped us to understand the linkages between precipitation, steam flow, and decadal atmospheric circulations. And also the study shows the acceleration of hydrologic cycle in Hudson Bay region, likely due to permafrost degradation. I want to acknowledge uh, different funding agencies that have supported this work, and we appreciate uh, their support. Hello, everyone. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce PRODA as a new approach to retrieve patterns and mechanisms from big data. And this work mainly done by Feng Tao, a graduate student from Tsinghua University, I'm Ichi Lu from Northern Arizona University. PRODA stands for Process Guided Deep Learning and Data Driven Modeling. It integrates big data with a process based model through data assimilation and deep learning. If you, the two papers on, the, on these slides provide more information about this approach. In the past 60 years, simulation modeling has been widely used by scientific community. Simulation modeling uses a model with a given structure and a parameter. The model is driven by meteorological data to generate results. And in past several years, machine learning, deep learning gained more uh, acknowledge, uh, recon recognition, and then machine learning is good at recon pattern recognitions, but uh, contribute less to our process understandings. Data-driven modeling, which primarily uses uh, data assimilation to select the model structure and the train parameters, this approach has been gradually used by our community in past 10 or 15 years. And uh, PRODA is an approach that combines data assimilation and then deep learning to further improve the model prediction. I'll use one application to illustrate the utility of a PRODA. The the application is mainly on the soil carbon vertical profile. Soil, <coughs> soil vertical profile has been collected worldwide for many centuries, uh, for many decades. And more than 100,000 data have been available, but it has been challenged to analyze such big data. We developed a product to, to meet the challenge. The second element of a product is a process-based model. In the past 10 years or so, my lab has developed a matrix approach to unify all the land carbon cycle models. We have uh, converted uh, nearly 20 models to a uniformed matrix, matrix uh, form. For example, we have converted the CLM5 into a matrix form. The original CLM5 
simulate the carbon dynamics across the seven pools within each of the 20 layers. So the original model used the 20, uh, 140 equations to track carbon movement in soil. We have converted that into a one matrix equation. And then we integrate the big data vertical profile with the Earth system model and use data simulation at the individual site to estimate the parameter values uh, at the site level. Then we apply deep learning to predict parameter values, which is uh, spatially heterogeneity from those estimated parameter at individual sites and then predict global uh, carbon patterns. And the retrieved the spatial pattern of a soil organic matter is much better than the uh, default model or the, the model after data assimilation. The retrieved pattern of a global soil carbon storage and the residence time and you can see these uh, results presented in these slides. We also retrieved the mechanisms underlying the global uh, soil carbon storage, including the carbon input, uh, input allocation, baseline decomposition, environmental uh, modifier, uh, microbial carbon use efficiency, and the vertical transport. We evaluate the relative importance of retrieved mechanisms. And from these, these slides, you can see the microbial carbon use efficiency is much more in, important than, than carbon input and than the baseline decomposition rate in determining the uh, soil carbon uh, uh, distributions. Overall, we developed a, a product as a new approach to retrieve not only patterns, but also processes and mechanisms from big data. The product integrate, integrates big data with Earth system model by data assimilation and the deep learning. We have applied the product to soil, soil carbon vertical profiles to retrieve global patterns for soil carbon stock, residence time, and their underlying processes. We find that microbial carbon use efficiency is more important than the carbon input and all the baseline uh, decomposition uh, in determining global soil carbon storage. I also like to thank other contributors to these, these studies on these slides. I'd like to take the last opportunity to announce a fourth training course on new advances in land carbon cycle modeling. We are still accepting applications until uh, March 15th. Hello everyone and welcome to NACP. I'll be presenting today an analysis about carbon water use efficiencies using ecosystem models. I want to briefly here to talk about the environmental drivers of carbon water use efficiency. Uh, so a low carbon use efficiency is an indication of higher respiratory cost and longer growing season, as well as decrease in nutrient, uh, nutrient and a higher carbon use efficiency indication of low temperature and low precipitation. While for water use efficiency, uh, low water use efficiency is an indication of high precipitation and high water use efficiency is an indication of low stomatal conductance or low precipitation. Well, what will happen in a warmer and drier scenario is what we might expect. We expect carbon use efficiency to decrease, mainly due to increased respiratory cost, and water use efficiency to increase due to low stomatal conductance. Well, if we add the CO2 fertilization there, we find that studies support an increase in water use efficiency with time. But how about carbon use uh, efficiency? It's still unknown, mostly because we don't have enough data to come with a conclusion about that. This is a time series of carbon use efficiency for 10 models participated in the MISMIP project. Uh, on the y-axis, I have carbon use efficiency here plotted as the net change relative to 1901 value. We see the models have different trends and magnitudes. In panel A, that looks at the effect of climate, majority of the models uh, showing very little 
uh, effect with some showing a negative trend after 1980. Independence B and C, looking at the atmospheric CO2 concentration effect or end deposition, majority of the models showing an increasing trend, couple showing a decreasing trend. This could be related whether the change uh, in autotrophic respiration is greater than MPP. If it's greater, then the model will show a decrease in carbon use efficiency. So models that also trying to inc uh, increase or favor tree growth um, risk increasing autorespiration and decreasing carbon use efficiency with CO2 fertilization. Now, on panel D, we looked at the combined effect of climate atmospheric CO2 and deposition on carbon use efficiency. We see majority of the model have a near constant carbon use efficiency, contradicting observations. So we ask here for modification for some of the processes, particularly carbon allocation, autorespiration in these models to better predict carbon use efficiency with time. Similarly, the uh, time series of water use efficiency shows in panels B, C, and D an increase of water use efficiency and time, uh, similar to observations that we see particularly for CO2 fertilization, suggesting that also the model's tomato conductance might be decreasing similar to observations again. In panel A, we have the effect of climate, and we can see that some of the models are having decreasing trend in water use efficiency after 1980. And we attribute some of the differences there that we see in water use efficiency for those models and how uh, stomatal conductance and photorespiration are parameterized in those models that can lead to decrease in GPP. And here we have uh, a plot showing the, in the dominant environmental drivers uh, for the model's carbon and water use efficiency. So as you see, majority of it is in a blue, which is uh, indicating that C2 fertilization is the main drivers for those models. Uh, and we have one model, whether it's in water or carbon use efficiency, that is mostly driven by climate. And uh, if we look in panel A, if we see CLM Vic and CLM4, uh, their carbon use efficiency is mostly driven by nitrogen deposition. This could be an indication of a strong end limitation in these uh, models. Especially, we can see also the models disagree on the dominant environmental drivers uh, for carbon and water use efficiency with higher agreement around the tropics and lower agreement uh, in the temperate and boreal zone. Also, we can notice that the carbon and water use efficiency in those models in the boreal and the Arctic zone is driven by CO2 uh, levels or CO2 fertilization and to less extent by the changing climate. How about GPP, NPP, and ET? Uh, we looked at the spatial environmental driver for those three variables, and we can see that the trend we see or the, sp uh, the dominant drivers spatially for water use efficiency and carbon use efficiency are similar to what is GPP and NPP, but not ET. As you see here, ET is mostly driven by uh, climate in this model, not CO2 fertilization. Uh, but that is not reflected in the model's water use efficiency as an environmental driver. So it could be that that small C2 fertilization on ET here effect is due to model assumption that can lead to such uh, lower effects on ET. Here we have latitudinal variability um, in carbon water use efficiencies uh, between 1982-2008. In panel A, it reflects the climate effect. We see that there is a agreement in the model. There is a convergence there in the model uh, in terms of the, the variability with latitude. While in panel B, which is the CO2 effect, we see there is a divergent in the model, particularly for uh, water use efficiency. What is the role of the model's soil moisture and temperature in the latitude and variability of the model's carbon and water use efficiencies? So after plotting the latitude and variability in soil moisture and soil temperature, as you see here, for the models that provided such information, uh, we found no link. Even models like CLM4 and CLM4-VIC have different, completely different hydrology, still their carbon and water use efficiencies were almost identical. This brings me for, uh, to my last point, how did models do? Were they able to replicate what we see in observations? While in uh, regarding carbon use efficiency, there is no agreement within the model in terms of magnet and trend. And even uh, if you recall, when we look at the BG1 simulations, uh, models show near constant carbon use efficiency with time, uh, contradicting observations, so more work need to be done there to improve these models' uh, uh, representation or processes that impact uh, carbon use efficiency. Models have done much better for water use efficiency. They were able to replicate what we see in terms of increased water use efficiency with CO2 fertilization. We find that the models are highly sensitive to CO2 fertilization and show low sensitive to climate, and we argue that the models should consider the acclim acclimation of ecosystem to rise in temperature 
in order to increase the sensitivity of the uh, model's uh, carbon use efficiency to climate change. It does uh, appear for us from this uh, uh, experiment that CO2 fertilization is causing stomatal conductance to increase regardless of soil moisture availability. But does this mean that models with decreasing water use efficiency due to CO2 fertilization are not maintaining uh, near constant CICA ratio? We do believe this is what is happening, but we don't have enough data to verify that. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Andy Fox. I'm going to be uh, acting as the moderator for this session, uh, conveying questions from Slido to uh, our speakers um, who've just given this great series of talks. Uh, I see we've already got quite a few questions in Slido for us to start with, but it'd be great uh, if you have questions to go to slido.com forward slash NACP and enter your question there. The questions are moderated. So there will be a slight delay between you entering your question and it appearing. Um, we have basically 20 minutes uh, to, to address some of these questions. Um, some I know will be for specific speakers and others I'm hoping will, uh, will be answered by several people on the panel here and we can maybe get a bit of a discussion going. Um, so without further ado, uh, I guess I'll work through uh, questions as they are here at the moment in sort of the order the day of the talks. So we have a question here for Debbie, um, which was, uh, how long was the, was the transient run in the experiments? And would you expect to see divergence in soil stocks on, over that time frame? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the transient runs were 110 years. Um, so they went from 1901 to 2010. So um, we would expect to see some divergence from steady state conditions, but maybe not as much as over a 300 year time period or longer. So that is a good question in terms of like deviations from steady state conditions. Okay. Um, and then we have a question here for um, Rizu, um, which was, uh, where where do the trends in the prior uh, come from? So I guess in, in the background um, and uh, is it is that trend due to natural or human emissions? Uh, thanks. Uh, that is a very uh, great question. Uh, uh, actually, I miss uh, a lot of uh, technical details because of the time limits. So uh, what we are focusing on is the emissions only from the cities. So, uh, but the question is that uh, the XL2 from OCO2 data uh, actually uh, contains uh, all sources uh, CO2. So basically we separate the, the XL2 into three parts. Uh, the first one is from the cities. Uh, the second one is from the uh, outside of the cities. And the third one uh, is the, uh, the natural sources. So uh, to uh, remove the, those uh, outside and uh, bio signals, we uh, use the, uh, uh, the emissions from uh, several products. So for uh, bio parts, we use a, a product called MISMIF. Uh, we use that uh, as the uh, uh, as bio flux and uh, uh, simulate the distribution of bio uh, XL2 simulation and uh, uh, for the uh, for human emissions, we use a product called uh, Audiac and we separated the, uh, the human emissions uh, in the city and outside the city. Then uh, we subtract the uh, bio and the outside of the city emissions uh, from the total uh, CO2. Then we got the uh, signals from the cities. Then we cal uh, calculated the uh, trend in the city. So uh, in short, uh, we used uh, only human emissions uh, as a, a prior, but we uh, subtract the uh, CO2 from other sources from the total uh, CO2 uh, in uh, OCO2 data. Thanks. 
Okay, great, thank you. So yeah, we've got a few more questions coming into uh, the Slido. Everyone feel free to add additional questions uh, if you have any. Uh, there's a question here for, for Altaf, um, which is, uh, what are the next steps to show a causal relationship between permafrost degradation and increased discharge? Uh, does the model simulate these processes well? Uh, yes, th this is this is a big, big question. So this is the first time we applied the model in this. This is a very, very challenging uh, landscape with very sparse data. So uh, if we can have a, uh, observation data uh, for the permafrost degradation so that uh, we can test it furthermore. So that's why we use the term we think or speculate about it. But uh, the uh, good part in the model is that it has, now we can define, uh, it has a multi-layer rather than the three layers in the old, we have a, a six layers and we can uh, change the depth of these layers. So the model is much uh, sophisticated uh, as compared to the past. So the reason we went uh, to this atmospheric study uh, here was that we see a very clear uh, difference in the stream flows uh, in the eastern versus the western uh, uh, watersheds. So, so we brought in the atmospheric studies as well uh, to address it. Is this just a southern, a more kind of a watershed giving more discharge because of this, or is also a combination of the atmospheric uh, processes, more precipitation ha happening? Uh, so, so we will be looking uh, into it uh, more and we have the tools and the next step would be to turn on the carbon uh, cycle model as well and stream flow discharge and the ice jamming uh, these are missing uh, so we may add uh, those processes and there are well established studies on uh, this kind of work as well so so th there's a lot uh, there's a lot that we can do and uh, there's just been a quick follow-up question for you, Altaf, which is, um, you know, has your new modeling framework been evaluated and calibrated globally? Uh, not this particular, uh, no. Uh, this couple model is not, but our class uh, model where we had the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle, we have tested at the site level studies as part of NS, uh, NSCP studies, and then we applied it at the global scale uh, as well. So those parts are tested, but the MESH is a Canadian model uh, that is used across Canada uh, in different watersheds. So uh, our goal is to go with these catchments, but we'll apply across uh, the uh, catchments in Canada. So I showed this picture, uh, but that will take some time. Uh, to establish the model, because establishing a model is a challenge. But the watershed that I've shown, a lot of hydrologic studies has been done uh, as part of different past studies. So we'll have a lot of more data available, uh, and then it would be uh, more easy to apply uh, in those watersheds because there would be some background information available. So we have a PhD student now working who just started. Uh, so we think in one or two years, we will see more uh, results. Thanks. Okay, great. So yeah, just a reminder, folks, feel free to submit more questions in Slido. Uh, but yeah, here we have a question for, for Ichi. Uh, Ichi, uh, what would be the best way to include microbial carbon use efficiency in earth system models? Can this be done in a way that doesn't, that this doesn't introduce massive amounts of extra complexity? So, so I guess that question is in the context of sort of process-based uh, microbial models, perhaps. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, for our particular study uh, I presented today, you know, we haven't uh, evaluated and then the selected so-called the best uh, microbial uh, carbon use efficiency model. I think uh, probably we should do what we did was uh, we used the uh, NCLAS uh, cl uh, community land model version five, and uh, we converted that to a matrix equation. And we considered that the transfer coefficient, basically the, how much carbon used, the, you know, conversion from one pool to another pool, and then fraction of that, 
will move to the next pool and then the fraction of them released. That fraction actually moving to the next pool usually facilitates the by micro and the original model like uh, you know the the central model and the you know original paper that justify those transfer coefficients is related to microbial model. I understand that in the past several years, the many uh, different type of model has been developed to represent microbial carbon use efficiency. I think as community, we should evaluate which one is better. But uh, you know, I, we haven't uh, evaluated uh, yet, and uh, hopefully we will do in the future. But if uh, community have done, and uh, we try to you know try to read more paper to see if. Uh, if that has been select, you know, evaluate the, what would be the best way to incorporate the microbial carbon use efficiency in a system model. Hopefully, I answer your question. Uh, and actually, that's, there's another question just come in for you, Ichi. Uh, and this is: uh, Do you think uh, that traditional data assimilation techniques will be replaced by the deep learning and machine learning? Um. Today, based, uh, today, the approach we presented uh, is a combined data assimilation with uh, deep learning and uh, machine learning. And uh, deep learning and uh, machine learning alone is supposed to be very good to recover patterns over space and over, over time. And, but the machine learning, deep learning, you know, by default, it's not very good to uh, to stimulate, the, uh, well, basically not very good at the process understanding. This issue has been discussed in the literature quite a lot. Uh, but on the other hand, data assimilation, you know, work with the, can work with the process-based model that can enhance our process-based understanding. So today, the approach we presented, uh, we so-called PRODA, you know, process-guided machine learning combined with uh, data-driven uh, modeling, so we call PRODA, basically try to combine the best of the two approaches. So answer, answer your question. In short, basically, I don't think machine learning and deep learning should or would replace data simulation or process-based modeling. Great, thanks. Uh, uh, Basil, we have a question for you here. Um, it says, uh, why would temperature acclimation increase sensitivity of carbon use efficiency to climate? Doesn't acclimation reduce sensitivity? And well, that's a, that's a good question. And, uh, you know, there was some detail missed up, um, you know, in, in a short period of time again. But the idea is in, in many of those uh, these models, the, uh, whether you're, some of them parameterize NPP to uh, be a fixed, value of GPP, uh, or when you look at their carbon use efficiency, it's kind of a set on a fixed value. So whatever you had um, at 1900, so the temperature, what I'm saying, like they, they set it at a certain temperature, the temperature have increased, so that now the ecosystem is adjusted to the higher temperature, the model is not adjusting to that. So that's kind of the um, analogy coming here. So hopefully it answered your question, so I can see the, um, misunderstanding but the, the model usually is not changing anything with temperature it's staying kind of fixed and that's the idea that they need to adjust to the higher temperature and uh, make it more dynamic the carbon use efficiency um, from year to year similar sometimes not all of them has a that much variable in terms of uh, maybe npp how it's changing with other environmental conditions so so it's kind of go back mostly to how the model is parameterizing what they want it to do and uh, um, whether you have a fixed uh, aspect of CN ratio and all those things in the model that will limit uh, how flexible is that carbon use efficiency is allowed to vary from the year to year. Okay, thank you. So yeah, if uh, we still got a few more questions to get through here, but we still have five minutes. So. Um... If anyone has any additional questions, please put them into, into Slido and I can relay them. Um, so here's a question uh, from, from, uh, from Asko Normitz. Uh, and Asko is asking, 
well, he's, he's asking Debbie and Ichi, but I'm sure we all have something to say about this. Uh, do your models consider the recent evidence of tight coupling of soil carbon dynamics to plant derived carbon inputs? I don't know. Do know. <laughs> um, yeah, I was I was waiting for you to go first. Then, um, I mean, in terms of you know the the models in Misty MIP, um, you know, I I'm trying to, I'm not sure I quite 100% understand um, the question in terms of soil carbon. Yeah, we do see um, a clear relationship between soil carbon stock size and um, the 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 magnitude of say you know. NPP um, in models. And so if you look at, if you kind of just plot um, both variables against one another, you're seeing um, those models that have larger inputs of carbon from productivity um, have much larger carbon pool sizes overall. Um, but I'm not sure exactly if that's answering the question. Ichi, do you have thoughts on that? Well, no, I'll, I'll try to add something. And uh, Asko, it's a great question. And, uh, um, you know, whether model has been represented well about the close the couple, uh, close the coupling between carbon input and the soil carbon dynamic, and you know, how well represented it, probably this need to be further evaluated. But most of the model, like, uh, you know, the uh, carbon cycle model we have, that do have a quite close coupling between uh, carbon input and the soil carbon dynamic, and uh, thinking about you know the if a car uh, carbon you know fixed the carbon this year, usually they probably eighty percent of them are released back to atmosphere through those uh, fast turnover pools, and the twenty of them probably stay uh, longer, and it really depends on the model setting and the, the if uh, if you have a really long resonance time. The coupling will be weaker. If a resonance time is shorter, the coupling is a is a, it's a, it's a closer. So so I think uh, you know, Asko, it's a great question, and probably we need to use the data to evaluate and uh, how how well the current model or models that represent the coupling, and uh, and then that's also probably very important. Uh, way to constrain the resonance time and uh, i'm not sure if uh, the help 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 you okay, okay so yes here's a uh, here's, here's a big question that's just just come in which uh, we can perhaps all uh, have some share our thoughts on and that is um please share thoughts on carbon models and manipul and manipulative experiments with respect to carbon dioxide removal and climate intervention technologies and strategies so yeah i guess you know how, how can this sort of work that we've been discussing really feed into you know these sort of practical responses to carbon dioxide removal and, and, and intervention any thoughts on that Well, uh, probably I'll try to, uh, you know, throw my two cents first and then probably other can, can add uh, or the correct. So I think, uh, you know, currently those uh, basically model is a tool and, and a model, better model, uh, basically probably can represent the system dynamic uh, in, uh, better. So with model, probably uh, the model can help evaluate the effectiveness of those uh, manipulative experiments uh, in terms of uh, you know, carb carbon dioxide removal or the uh, climate mitigation. And uh, basically different strategy, different uh, manip manipulative experiment, and the model can be uh, used as the first tool to evaluate the effectiveness. Certainly, the you know the real whether this is really effective. We still need more data and to constrain models. So that uh, would uh, be my thought. Thank you for asking that question. I can add something too, kind of based on discussions that Ichi and I have had, and and some of the work that Ichi's done. You can use if you're thinking about kind of 
management, climate management or mitigation approaches and how can models be used to inform those types of decision um, decisions or policies, you know, you know, each is is in his matrix form of the model has come up with like, oh, what's the, the carbon storage potential um, of ecosystems or below ground um, like soil carbon stocks to additional carbon uptake and storage over time? And how does that vary across ecosystems and, and ecoregions and different management um, approaches? And so I think, you know, like Ichi said, models are tools and, and we can use them to help inform decision making. Okay, great. So, oh, we're already, I believe, at the end of our allotted time period. It's uh, 20 past 12 here in Boulder. Uh, so we'll have to wrap up the, the, this session now. Um, as uh, Libby mentioned, you can contact the speakers directly uh, through the, the link in the agenda once you're logged in. Also, you know, please take a look at the posters. Um, I believe we're up to about 150 posters now, uh, of which 10 are directly linked to this session, but I'm sure many of them are, are of general interest. Uh, we're now going into a 10 minute break before returning to the next uh, organized science session, which is uh, advances in methane measurement, attribution and modeling. So yes, back in 10 minutes.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back to uh, the NACP meeting. I am Guillermo Moray from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and along with uh, Benjamin Polter, we'll be coordinating this session. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. We have some excellent presentations uh, in our session for advanced and retained measurements, uh, attribution, and modeling. Uh, please, if you have any questions, just post them on the slider link, which you can find uh, below. And uh, without further delay, I'll leave you to the presentations. Hello, everyone. My name is Pascal Mitra. The focus of my talk will be on the controls of methane emissions at subannual scale and also on the interannual variability of CO2 and CH4 fluxes. Our study site is a natural forest wetland, which is approximately 100 years old. It is a core Mariflux site located and it is coded as USNC4 in the Mariflux database. It is located on the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge on the Albert Malde Family Co Peninsula. Key characteristics of our site include lack of astronomic tides, precipitation being the main source of water, and a water table which is constantly fluctuating. Let us first look at the spectral properties of methane fluxes across our study site. We see significant peaks at the daily resolution, with peaks also at synoptic and monthly resolution. The presence of this peak suggests that there are multiple overlapping drivers of methane fluxes across our study site. To have a better understanding of these drivers, we have used a heat map and, and phase diagram. The point of interest in the heat map are these areas of red color, areas of high power, which is all from a statistical perspective, areas of high correlation. It, this area, this red map gives, a, gives you an idea how the methane time series and the environmental or the biological time series co-vary. And the direction of arrows in, within the red colored zone gives you an idea of the nature of the relationship. If the arrows are on the right, as shown here, we are inferring cause causal relationship between methane and the drivers. If arrows are on the left, we are inferring correlation. The values on the y-axis of, of the heat map gives us an idea of the period of the different temporal resolution. Now, the, let's focus on the cross-wave transformation between methane and different biological and non -bio, uh, and bio, no, environmental drivers as highlighted in the five slides with the yellow background. We see significant peaks at different time temporal resolution. But for, for example, CH4 GPP cross-wave resolution uh, cross wavelet transformation shows significant peak at the daily resolution. CH4 atmospheric pressure shows uh, significant peaks at 5 days and 24 days, between CH4 water table shows at 26 days. These five slides can be summarized by this diagram, essentially suggesting there are multi scale drivers of methane fluxes. GPP LE driving the methane fluxes at daily resolution, pressure water table driving methane fluxes at synoptic, and, at synoptic or monthly scale. Let's put our focus back on the CH4 versus GPP relationship. The heat map uh, and the phase diagram suggest that at the diurnal scale and at the growing season, we see significant co correlation between methane and GPP, and the direction of arrows suggests a strong causal relationship. We get similar results when we do a CH4 versus LE or CH4 versus SAFLUX analysis. Since CH4 GPP cross wavelet transformation and CH4 LE cross wavelet transformation show significant peak at the daily resolution, the challenge lies in disentangling those two controls. So, which one is actually driving CH4 GPP or LE? To do to answer that question, we have used a lag lead analysis. First part of the lag lead analysis, we have uh, done mutual information analysis between CH4 GPP, CH4 LE. We have also done for SAFLUX, but I'm just showing you these two results. On the x-axis are your different temporal resolution, D1 to D11 scales. And we see that for different temporal resolution, the highest mutual information or the lowest or the, or the highest reduction in, or the reduction, greatest reduction in uncertainty is happening at the D5 scale, which is close to the diurnal scale. So we extract the D5 scale for CH4, GPP, LE, and SAFLUX. We lag them the, the time series by plus minus 12 hours, and we do cross correlation analysis between CH4, GPP, CH4, LE, and CH4, SAFLUX. And we extract the highest correlation coefficient and the corresponding lag hours, and we have summarized those results here for highest correlation coefficient versus lag hours for five different years. And we have used a criteria that the variable with the shortest positive lag time was the controlling factor. For five years, 
out of the five years we see most of the time it's GPP with the shortest positive lag time. So we've used that as the controlling factor. In one year we found SAP flux to be the controlling factor. Our phase diagram analysis between CH4 versus atmospheric pressure does shows that we do it does not yield any consistency. We see certain correlation early part of the year and during and at a high temporal resolution, but the inconsistent phase direction suggests the relationship is more correlated rather than causal. Since GPP is seems to be a very primary important factor in driving methane dynamics, it is important I show this particular figure to you. Panel A reflects the cumulative NEE budget for five for 10 different years across our study site. And you can see across from 2009 to 2019, we have seen the CO2, cumulative CO2 values are close to zero or the system is behaving as a weak carbon source. Only for two years, it's a very weak carbon sink. And then we compare those values with coastal uh, methane budget from coastal forested wetland from two different studies. Similarly, the methane budget shows from 2012 to 2017 has been shown here with the uncertainty and the values are compared with the methane budget from coastal forested wetland from another study. The key take home message from this figure are as follows. First, the CH4 fluxes of high magnitude and five-fold internal variability. The CH4 values are greater than 95% of the wetland, including tropical wetlands in Indonesia and Amazon. This is important. And I, and I cannot emphasize this enough, CH4 and CO2 fluxes do not have an inverse relationship, which begs the question, why is that so? And is disturbance a key history, a key factor? Let's not forget this system is a weak carbon source, which, which in turn will affect the GPP, which in turn will affect methane. Finally, summarizing our results, CH4 fluxes varies diurnally and is driven by substrate availability from photosynthesis. The short and consistent lag time lag between GPP and CH4 suggests a pressure concentration waves. The correlation between environmental conditions and transport with transpiration flux appears well merely correlational. The year-to-year -year variability of CH4 is not inversely related to NEE. And finally, we are hypothesizing that increased in hydro period and tree mortality are expected to lower GPP and perhaps have a lower priming effect on methane of course, before the ocean swallows the peninsula into the century. Finally, our results have been summarized in this study. And if you have any questions about study site, please don't hesitate to contact us. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Kong Yu Chen from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and I'd like to present the seasonal hysteresis in methane temperature relationships on behalf of my co-authors and FluxNet methane data contributors. Like many other biological reaction rates, Methane emission has been suggested to be proportional to environmental temperature by many studies. In particular, a recent meta-analysis indicates that the apparent activation energy for methane production rate inferred from pure culture is statistically consistent with that derived from ecosystem scale methane emission measurements and suggests that using such a consistent methane temperature dependence to improve carbon climate models. However, there are some limitations in this meta-analysis. For example, there were only about 1,500 data points in the ecosystem scale measurements, and effects of spatial and temporal variability were not recognized in this study. We think it'll be interesting to evaluate the emergent methane emission temperature dependence using the FluxNet methane community product that provides hundreds of thousands of covariance measurements reflecting methane temperature relationships across the globe. Here, the top panel indicates the sites included in the FluxNet methane community product. We extract data collected at global wetland and rice paddy sites and found a strong functional relationship between methane emission and temperature whose apparent activation energy for methane emission is comparable to those reported in Yvonne Show 2014 when temporal variability is muted. Although such a relationship appears to be suitable for to refine methane biogeochemistry parameterization, it is mechanistically flawed for underrepresenting the large spatial and temporal variability in apparent methane emission temperature dependence. The spaghetti plot at the bottom right is based on the same set of measurements used in the figure at bottom left, but the apparent methane emission temperature sensitivity 
T is calculated during the earlier and later parts of the individual site years. The large deviations in the inferred methane, methane temperature relations suggest that the apparent methane emission temperature dependence is sensitive to the sampling period. For example, the JPBBY site in northern Japan shows a typical seasonal cycle for temperature and methane emission measured in the northern hemisphere. Interestingly, when we plot the measured temperature and methane emission from the beginning to the end of a frost-free season, their relation appears to experience a counterclockwise hysteresis loop for each site year, meaning methane emission are high, generally higher later in the season at the same temperature. Ignoring such intraseasonal variability will overestimate methane emission in the earlier part of the season and underestimate methane emission in the later part of the season. We calculate the normalized hysteresis area enclosed by the two methane emission temperature dependence for each site year to quantify the seasonal methane emission hysteresis among site years across 48 wetland and rice paddy sites, and the results show that 77% site years are showing positive seasonal methane emission hysteresis, suggesting that intraseasonal variability needs to be represented for better methane budget estimate. We use a range of regression models and machine learning models to investigate factors regulating the emergent methane emission temperature dependence and examine the degree of complexity needed in methane emission parameterization. The models can be broadly categorized into three tiers. The first tier employs a generic emergent methane emission temperature dependence that does not represent spatial and temporal variability. The second tier recognizes the difference among ecosystem types, and the third tier recognizes site-to-site -site variability. For each ecosystem type, the absolute bias of modeled methane emission is lowest when ecosystem site variability is represented, demonstrating the importance of representing ecosystem site variability. Therefore, models should mechanistically represent methane biogeochemistry because site and time-specific emergent methane emission temperature dependence cannot be measured everywhere and all the time. To investigate potential mechanisms leading to hysteretic methane emission, we use a comprehensive model called ECOSYS to simulate the seasonal methane emission hysteresis observed in the Strodali Meyer and Udiavik. We further exam the Strodali Meyer fan site where we recently validated the model methane emission rate and methane production pathway using acetoclastic and hydrogenotrophic methanogen relative abundance inferred from 16 sRNA gene and platon sequencing data. Here's the time series we extracted from our Strodali Meyer fan simulation. It appears that methane production aligns closely with temperature and methane emission lags behind methane production with limited, limited oxidation simulated in the system. In addition to the seasonal methane emission hysteresis, we found strong methane production later in the season when the model soil temperature is the same which is likely driven by the higher amount of methanogen biomass later in the season due to the hysteretic methane methanogen growth respiration. Ignoring such intraseasonal variability like the black lines will typically overestimate methane production earlier in the season and underestimate methane production later in the season. Here's a schematic summarizing the above mentioned processes. Substrate production rate increases with increased temperature. Interestingly, substrate concentrations remain high after peak substrate production because weaker substrate consumption earlier in the season. Increased substrate availability stimulates higher methanogen biomass and activity later in the season, which fuels up methane production and leads to seasonal methane production hysteresis. To recap, we found predominantly positive methane emission hysteresis across global wetlands, which suggests methane models need to represent site-to-site -site variability, and the reason for the positive methane emission hysteresis is likely due to higher methane production, thereby increased substrate availability later in the season. Thanks for listening, and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Good afternoon. My name is Hannah Nasser, and I'm a fourth-year PhD candidate with Daniel Jacob at Harvard. 
I'm going to talk today about my work to reduce the computational cost of using atmospheric observations to improve constraints on methane emission sources at high resolution. This work is largely motivated by the launch of TRIPOMI, which now provides us with daily global retrievals of atmospheric methane columns at 7 by 5.5 kilometer squared pixel resolution. I show here the oversampled data for 2019, and what is immediately evident is TRIPOMI's 3% retrieval rate due to cloud cover and other limiting factors. Because of the heterogeneity of the coverage, any attempt to use this data to improve constraints on methane emission sources needs to consider the actual information content of the observations. We can do so using an inverse framework. In an inversion, an improved emissions estimate is generated by minimizing a cost function that represents the distance between the observations and the modeled observations weighted by the observational error and the distance between an initial emissions estimate and the improved emissions estimate weighted by the errors on that initial estimate. In the case that the forward model is linear, that is, that there is a linear relationship between the modeled observations and the emissions that can be characterized by the Jacobian matrix K, the cost function can be minimized using a variational or analytical approach. A variational approach iteratively updates an initial emissions estimate until the cost function minimum is converged upon. The analytical solute approach minimizes the cost function analytically. This approach also yields the error and information content associated with that improved emission estimate. The information content being given by the averaging kernel matrix A. And I show you here the three closed form expressions for each of those quantities. This is a significant benefit of the analytical approach, particularly in observing systems like TRIPOMI that have variable information content. Variational approaches can estimate these quantities. However, these are ensemble approaches that are only as good as the number of ensemble members. The analytical approach also allows us to find the true minimum of a cost function that is often shallow, while the variational approach may converge before achieving that minimum. And the analytical system allows us to conduct additional sensitivity tests at virtually no additional computational cost once the framework is established, allowing us to better understand the inverse system and the resulting solution. However, the analytical approach has a significant drawback that the computational cost is limited by the resolution at which emissions are optimized. The computational cost is largely attributable to the cost of constructing the Jacobian matrix that represents the linear relationship between the model observations and the emissions. This matrix is typically constructed using a finite difference scheme in which a given grid cell that's optimized by the inversion is perturbed in the forward model, generating a set of perturbed observations that yield the sensitivity of the observations to the emissions in that grid cell, a single column of the Jacobian. To construct the entire matrix, the forward model must be run once for every single grid cell that's optimized in the inversion. At quarter degree resolution over the North American domain, this requires 24,000 model runs. The obvious solution is to decrease the number of grid cells that we optimize in the inversion. We can do so by applying a linear transformation gamma that aggregates together grid cells. However, gamma need not aggregate together grid cells discreetly. In this case, the elements optimized by the inversion are not grid cells, but instead vectors. But it's difficult to understand what a 50% increase in pattern 1 and a 25% decrease in pattern 2 means for emissions in the Permian. As a result, we apply a second linear transformation gamma star that restores the original dimension of the problem, but not the information content that was lost by the initial dimension reduction. However, we can choose gamma and gamma star to minimize the loss of information content. In this case, the reduced rank space shown in the lower left is constructed on the basis of the dominant patterns of information content, those patterns that best explain the information content of the inverse system, essentially the leading eigenvectors of the averaging kernel matrix. We can construct a Jacobian in this reduced rank space by perturbing those patterns of information content in the forward model. The resulting inversion will optimize emissions where information content is high and default to the prior elsewhere. However, it's important to note that the information content that yields those patterns is itself a function of the Jacobian matrix. We therefore propose a method to iteratively improve an initial estimate of the Jacobian matrix that's constructed at low computational cost. And in what follows, I'll show you a demonstration of those methods and an inversion of GOSAT observations over the North American domain for July of 2009. We construct the initial estimate of the Jacobian using a mass balance approach in which we assume that the observations are most sensitive to local emissions. I show you here the column of the Jacobian matrix corresponding to the 750th grid cell optimized. This isn't a very good estimate, 
I show you here the corresponding columns of the native resolution Jacobian matrix. However, we only care if the initial estimate is able to reproduce the dominant patterns of information content. And we're able to reproduce those patterns. The information content is measured by the diagonal elements of the averaging kernel matrix, shown on the left for the native resolution inversion, depends largely on the prior error standard deviation, shown in the upper right, and on the observation density, shown in the lower right. The prior error standard deviation is given by the prior error covariance matrix, and the GOSAT observation density is characterized both by the observational error covariance matrix and by the sparsity structure of the Jacobian matrix. Because our initial estimate of the averaging kernel matrix, shown now on the left, has the common contributions of the error covariance matrices, and because the sparsity structure of the initial estimate of the Jacobian reflects the density of observations, the resulting information content reproduces the dominant patterns of information content at native resolution. We can then use that initial estimate of the averaging kernel to generate the patterns of information content that are used to construct the Jacobian, and we can solve the resulting inversion. I show you those results here. I show the posterior scaling factors on top and the averaging kernel sensitivities on bottom, for the native resolution inversion on the left, and the reduced rank inversion on the right. Despite using only a quarter of the model simulations, the reduced rank approach is able to solve for the posterior scaling factors accurately in areas where the information content is high, defaulting to the prior estimate elsewhere. Because of the ability of this approach to solve for methane emissions at high resolution at low computational cost, I'm using this method in an inversion of 2019 Tropomi observations at quarter degree resolution over North America. I look forward to discussing this work with you now and in the future. Thank you. Hello, I'm Daniel Cusworth. I'm a data scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I'm really excited today to talk to you about multi-tiered observing of methane. And so when we say multi-tiered observing, what I'm really talking about is leveraging any observation you might have of methane from the surface to satellites into some sort of unified observational uh, analytic framework that can be used specifically for um, actionable data, for mitigation, or to provide some sort of data set that someone can use and actually use to take action. And so, you know, there's many tiers of this multi-tiered system, um, many of which I'm sure we're all familiar with, but, you know, we think of satellites as being really good for global coverage, for global inversions, budgets, you know, now with, you know, advent of like Tropomi satellite, maybe we can get to regional flux inversions. We also have surface networks and like towers that get us at that regional flux inversion. Um, there's another opportunity with airborne campaigns. And so those have been both used for regional surveys, um, but also for point sources. Um, and more and more imaging spectrometers are being used to map individual plumes at facilities over wide areas. And also, you know, on-site surveys, again, so point source. And so, you know, oftentimes we see these studies in the literature um, as, you know, distinct and separate types of analyses. And that's great, but how do we put these together in a way that, you know, where we're leveraging the strengths of each type of data set? You know, what I plotted here on the left is an example in the Los Angeles Basin, where I'm showing all the different types of observations that we have of methane um, in the basin. And so the purple contours show, you know, more or less where we expect on a clear day to get tropomi observations. The uh, black diamonds representing our surface tower network. The blue squares representing um, the CLARS, uh, scans of the CLARS instrument. And so that's a, a scanning spectrometer that sits on top of Mount Wilson in Los Angeles. And the green lines representing Avaris NG. And so this is an airborne imaging spectrometer that gets at the plume scale. And on the right, you can see the strengths and weaknesses with temporal sampling. With a surface network, you have observations all the time. Um, but with remote sensing, you know, uh, like CLARS and Tropomi, you need to have clear skies. Um, and with uh, imaging, airborne imaging spectrometer, you need clear skies and you have to be able to fly the plane. You know, but so, you know, there's strengths and weaknesses with that, but how do we leverage that all into one system? And so what I'm going to show today is just one example of how to do that. And that is, you know, taking information from the towers, from the satellite. Um, you know, not every region has something like CLARS, but, you know, taking this type of information and putting it into a flux inversion or data assimilation um, and using that to get us to emission estimates at the kilometer scale. And once we have those types of emission estimates, we can use that to prompt 
follow-on surveys with an airborne uh, imaging spectrometer, or you know you could feasibly do it with mobile monitoring as well, something that gets at the, the point source. And so together, what we have is is a tiered observational system where we're really using each of these elements to um, inform decisions. And so. You know, going to the data assimilation portion, here's just a uh, example I have of what's the average sensitivity that observations have to the underlying emissions within Los Angeles Basin. And so if you look at, you compare and contrast tropomi and the surface network, um, you can see something that generally corroborates our intuition that with tropomi, because of its broader sampling, you know, you get more spatial coverage, but with a surface network, you have towers next to the ground. So you get higher sensitivity right next to those towers, but really the benefit comes in the multi-tiered system because now you're leveraging both. You're leveraging the spatial, but with really the higher sensitivity near those towers. And you can put that into a Bayesian system. I won't go into the details. I'm sure many are familiar, but really where you try to take those observations, balance them with the prior and come up with an, um, an optimized emission estimate in the basin. And that's what I have an example here. So we've assimilated these observations between 2017 and 2018, and a few hotspots pop out if we compare against the prior that we used. And you know, and one that's most striking is really up in this um, northwestern part of Los Angeles, in the kind of San Fernando Valley area, we see um, emissions higher than what the prior maybe would have predicted. And this is an area of pretty heterogeneous activity um, the Sunshine Canyon landfill is there, also the Aliso Canyon gas storage facility is there. And so this is kind of what we're getting at. Look, we've gone from, uh, by combining this information, we've gone to kilometer scales of hotspots that lets us isolate a region, but we still don't have any source identification. So why don't we zoom in in this area around Sunshine Canyon landfill? On the left, I have the inverse fluxes, but on the right, I'm showing plumes that we identified um, with our airborne imaging spectrometer. And so this is a landfill face, and we saw these big plumes emanating from the landfill face way back in 2017, contacted the landfill, and they were aware of odor complaints, but um, they used these maps that we generated to see, okay, it smells really bad on this landfill, but uh, you know where are the problematic areas? We gave them this data, and actually over the course of the next year, they implemented it. They put in a bunch of remediation actions, um, two in particular called a closure turf, which is like astroturf on the um, intermediate slopes of the landfill, and posi shell, posi shell, which is like a cement mixture that they sprayed on the landfills. And when we came back and did follow-up campaigns in the subsequent year, um, we saw that it really the, the emissions went away. Um, and if you look here on this panel on the right, the blue represents um, odor complaints from the community and on the red dots represent what we uh, found to be the excess methane mass from our imaging spectrometer and they correlate really well. And then if you take a, another step back and you say, well, what did our fluxes do in our system during that time period? You can see there's also a very consistent trend between the two. So, you know, we were able to identify this hotspot with the flux inversion, um, went and interrogated it with our airborne campaign that got at the point source scale, that provided data that was actionable, and then we could actually validate the remediation that happened. And so this is just one example um, of a success with a multi-tiered observing system, but it can be replicated in many regions. And really, if we broaden our thinking of, you know, how do we combine things, how do we fuse these data and keep on the top of our head, you know, actionable data, I think it can go a long way to really uh, reducing our methane output. Okay, thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Chen. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to all of you. Today I'm going to talk about the cause of the rising atmospheric methane concentration in the past decade. The main focus of this talk is the fundamental question. Are natural sources or anthropogenic sources driving the recent methane rise? The rising methane question has been actively debated for several years, and this is not only due to the importance of understanding the methane budget in the context of climate mitigation, but also due to the puzzling temporal pattern. Atmospheric methane plateaued from 1999 to 2006, but resumed in 2007 and accelerated in 2013. And this renewed rise is accompanied with a negative trend of its carbon-13 isotope signature. Many hypotheses have been proposed to explain this pattern, 
The bottom plot is an example of how the global methane budget looks like and what are the carbon-13 methane signature for individual source. A negative trend of observed atmospheric carbon-13 methane indicates that higher contribution from biogenic sources such as wetland or agriculture are possibly driving the rise. A recent study using process-based model found that a likely step increase from wetland during the renewed period, and do, this is mainly due to rising temperature and enhanced precipitation in the tropics. At the same time, there are two hypotheses about the role of fossil fuel emissions, whether it's increasing in the past years or has no increase but was systematically underestimated. Other than these factors, biomass burning, although it has a relatively low methane emissions, it has a strong leverage effect because it's a heavy isotope signature. There are also debates about the magnitude of geological source, where the ge low geological source hypothesis suggests fossil fuel emission was systematically underestimated because they have a similar carbon-13 methane signature. So we ask, why not we test all these hypotheses within a clearly defined framework? Basically, what we've done is to use an atmosphere two-box model to simulate the methane concentration and the carbon-13 isotopes. We use a comprehensive set of source estimates to represent different hypotheses. We use a spatially resolved methane signature map for, for major sources and the Monte Carlo approach to quantify the uncertainty. The model was first run in inverse mode to derive OH time series, which is the largest methane sink that can reproduce the methane concentration observations. And then we evaluate all these hypotheses by running the model in the forward mode with the calculated time series of isotope in the source. This treatment is based on the conclusion from recent studies that the uncertainties in methane sinks are large enough to explain any potential methane growth scenarios. Here are the results. You can see from the top left of the plot, every single run reproduced the observed methane concentration. But for methane isotope, you can see a wider range of modeled atmospheric methane signature value, with some closely reproducing the observations. If you look at the density distribution of RMSE on the right hand side, it is clearly can be seen that the decadal scale variation in atmospheric methane concentration are dominated by also projected sources from both agriculture and fossil fuel emissions. You can see FDR 4.2 for fossil fuel and agriculture have higher bias than the other estimate, which is consistent with findings from previous studies. However, the step increase in wetland methane emissions has limited improvement over the non-wetland increase scenarios. The results also indicate larger decrease in biomass burning and the low geological source have lower RMSE. Then we want to ask, what if the wetland estimate is wrong in the box model simulation? We all know that the wetland mass emission by process-based model have large uncertainties. So to answer this question, we carry out a sensitivity test to calculate idealized wetland emissions that can reproduce the magnitude of the negative trend in carbon-13. We run the box model in the inverse mode for each individual run, given the other sources, the running OH concentration, atmospheric observations, and the isotope signature of the sources, which thus linearizes the problem. From the left, you can see the time series of idealized wetland methane emissions with a seven-year moving window. It is grouped by different fossil fuel estimates. This means that the idealized wetland methane emissions largely depend on the hypothesis of fossil fuel emissions, where greater wetland increase are required to compensate for the large increase in the fossil fuel emissions. The solid and the dashed lines in black and gray are process-based estimates from wet charts and Chang uh, 2007. Uh, the Chang 2007 is an ensemble estimate under RCP 8.5, so it can be considered as the upper bound of wetland methane feedback to the rising temperature. You can see the required methane emissions are much higher than the process-based estimate. On the right is the comparison of linear trend. Two recent inversion studies based on goal-set methane 
measurement suggests a positive wetland trend of, of around 2 to 3 teragram methane per year for 2010 to 2018. However, to produce such significant trend, the Q10 parameter in the wetland models would need to be much higher than the range of 2 to 3 from process-based model or the flux net measurement. So we conclude that the hypothesis of a large increase from natural wetland driving the decrease in atmosphere methane isotope cannot be reconciled with process-based wetland models. At the end, we calculate the most likely scenarios by selecting the first percentile cutoff of the lowest bias. The bar plot reflects the conclusion that agricultural emissions are the largest, with the fossil fuel emissions has the highest uncertainty and the wetland emissions is not likely dominating the increase. Thank you. Welcome everyone to the last talk of this session. My name is Suresh Basu. I'm going to tell you about some research we've been doing in trying to disaggregate the different sources of methane using atmospheric isotope measurements. Uh, this was funded initially by a NASA IDS grant. And as you can see from the list of people and institutes, it's a rather large collaboration. So how do methane isotopes tell us about the different sources of methane? If you start with total methane as an example, then you can think of the atmospheric burden of methane or the gradients or the time trends being affected by the sum total of the emissions of methane of all different categories. So microbial, fossil, biomass burning. Now, because each of these categories have their distinct, unique source signatures of 13 methane, that is the ratio of 13 carbon to 12 carbon in them, if you could measure atmospheric 13 CH4, you would get an additional constraint. And this can be represented visually as a seesaw, where now you put those blocks representing the different sources at different positions on the seesaw representing their isotope signatures. And the thing has to balance horizontally on a fulcrum provided by atmospheric measurements. And during this project, we constructed an inversion framework to do this globally with the help of a transport model and give us spatially disaggregated maps of these different source categories of methane. Since this is a short talk, I'll get straight to the results. The first thing I'm going to show you are fits to atmospheric C13 data uh, from inversions that assimilate only methane, the blue squares, and inversions that assimilate methane and C13, those are the orange triangles. The first thing I want you to notice is that a methane-only inversion does not reproduce the C13 time series in the atmosphere. So that means that a, a methane-only inversion is unlikely to produce a source distribution of methane that is consistent with both methane and C13 measurements. And this is not just at one site, I'm showing Mauna Loa here, but I see that at South Pole, I see that at American Samoa, which is an equatorial site. And so it makes me say that very likely a joint methane inversion, a methane and C13 inversion will produce better or more accurate fluxes than a methane only inversion. The one additional curiosity from a background site was at Barrow, and I've seen this at Alert as well, where it seems like my prior is missing some wetland fluxes in the high north. So even when I assimilate methane and C13 from these sites, I do not reproduce the C13 exactly. There is a small positive bias in the model. And I think this is due to wetlands because I can get rid of some of that bias or I can reduce that bias by using a wetland prior which has more wetland emissions in the high north. The second kind of result I'm going to show you are annual fluxes. So here I've disaggregated the annual fluxes over almost two decades into three geographical regions, northern extratropics, tropics, and southern extratropics. And I'm showing the total methane flux, the microbial flux, and the fossil flux. And the first thing to note is that pretty much like most methane inversions I have seen in the literature, with in our inversions as well, whether it be the joint C13 and methane or just the methane, the tropical fluxes are increased and the extratropical fluxes are decreased. And this seems to be a fairly robust feature of all the sensitivity tests we have done. The second thing that I would like to note 
is that if you look at the partitioning between uh, microbial and fossil fluxes, once you add C13 data, in the tropics and southern extratropics, the fossil emissions go down and the microbial emissions go up. So the total emissions in the tropics and southern extratropics are the same whether you have C13 data or not, but the partitioning between fossil and microbial changes significantly. The third result I'm going to show you has to do with the period of renewed growth in atmospheric methane post-2007. As baseline, we took the seven years prior to 2007 as the flat period and looked at our uh, emissions from our inversions, which are in the second column. The shaded bars are the priors, the solid bars are the posteriors. Then we looked at seven years after 2007 as our period of study, which is now the third column. Again, shaded bars prior, solid bars posteriors. And we looked at the difference between those two periods, which are now in these uh, yellow shaded column to the, to the extreme right. And what we saw is that in an inversion, if we added C13 data to methane, it reduced the fossil contribution to that growth somewhat, and it increased the microbial contribution. And we wanted to know if this was due to our prior setup, because in the prior, we matched the atmospheric growth over the entire two decades by primarily changing the microbial sectors. So we redid the inversion where we used climatological priors for all the categories, so none of them had any trend, they were all flat. And it was even more striking. What we saw is that a methane-only inversion will say that about 80% of the post-2007 growth is from fossil fuels, fossil methane. Whereas if you add C13 data to it, it will reduce that number to 40 and say that 60% of that growth is from microbial sources. So three important lessons or conclusions from today. First, a methane-only in inversion is unlikely to produce fluxes that are consistent with both atmospheric methane and atmospheric C13 data. Second, of, of the different priors we have tried, none seem to have enough wetland fluxes in the high north to match the atmospheric C13 time series at places like Barrow and Alert. Third, a methane-only inversion attributes most of the post-2007 methane growth to fossil sources, or a large part of it, whereas a joint inversion consistent with both C13 and methane data attribute most of that growth to microbial sources. And what are we doing right now? We are trying to calculate robust uncertainties and calculate the sensitivity to different setups like chemistry and source signature. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you enjoy the session. We have some great presentations, and so we have some amazing questions following up. We have some inquiries and uncertainties about integration and the drivers of uh, methane emissions. So I'm going to ask the first question, which is about shale gas. Um, so how is the increase in shale gas um, the cause for new growth rate? Or is it due to other sources, such as freshwater systems, um, who wants to answer this question? Cheng, do you want to take this question? Oh, yes, uh, sure. Uh, thanks for the question. And uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, shell gas uh, emissions has been getting a lot of attention in, in this community because uh, um, it, it is some, some of the reason the um, studies showing the uh, Shell gas uh, isotope signal could be uh, much uh, lighter than was uh, than it was thought uh, thought and uh, was proposed by Robert Howard from uh, Cornell University and uh, there has been a lot of discussion on this and uh, we 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 take a we carry out a um, sensitivity test uh, using the box model and and to to test if it uh, if the shell gas emission could act, actually causing this uh, depletion of atmosphere missing certain uh, signature, uh, but uh, based on our result, uh, it's uh, it it's a it it, can, it has a little impact on the isotope uh, carbon missing certain signature. So 
I, I we our conclusion in, is uh, I think it's a uh, not we cannot tell this uh, if it's a uh, shell gas rise can cause the change in the uh, it, it can be it, it, I don't know if the, we can it, it can be detectable so that's uh, what we what we found from the box model study and yeah and anyone have any comment thank you I can, I can add uh, that I would agree that if you attribute most of the increase to shale gas, it's not going to satisfy the trend in atmospheric C13, because this is something you can tell unequivocally, because shale gas and microbes and biomass burning, they have very different signatures, and it, the atmospheric C13 is not going in a direction that would suggest or support that most of it is shale gas. The other piece of evidence was there was a paper, I think a couple of years back from Shin Lan at NOAA, she looked at aircraft profiles and vertical gradients over the US. And if it, the gradients are not changing fast enough to support this idea that most of the trend is coming from shale gas exploration, either in the US or Canada. Thank you. This also leads us to one of the questions for both of you. Um, someone's asking, uh, your soul seems to be attributing this renewing growth to opposite sources. Um, how do you reconcile um, what you found? Um, it's it's actually attributing, it, 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 they're not conflicting. So if you look at Jen's conclusions, he has a breakdown towards the end of his talk where he says X percent is from industrial fossil sources and Y percent is from agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at that industrial fossil source number, that's 35 or 37 percent in that order. And from my global inversions, I find a very similar number. I find 40% uh, of the, like post, two, if you subtract the post 2007 from the pre 2007, sorry, the other way, if you subtract the pre 2007 from the post 2007 numbers, about 40% of the increase is from fossil methane. And so in that sense, we actually agree. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Sorish. I mean, uh, so for from so we, in our study we use like we consider all um, almost uh, every um, possible uh, hypothesis regarding the uh, industrial fossil fuel trend, and we 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 even consider um, this uh, uh, we the the fossil fuel and methane emission were uh, systematically underestimated. Uh, so. If, if you look at the final, uh, the last slides in, our, in my presentation, uh, you can see the fossil fuel industrial uh, emission contribute has has the largest uh, uncertainty. Uh, uh, and uh, if you if you can if you choose the upper bound of the contribution for fossil fuel, it could be uh, higher, potentially higher than, than agriculture. But uh, uh, in in short, it's, it's, this is uh, still like. Uh, uh, quite, uh, we need more evidence. We need more evidence, more observations to like figure out uh, if if uh, the fossil fuel or agriculture is a uh, is a uh, which one is the largest contribute contributor to the atmospheric methane rise. Thank you. This leads to an additional follow up question for both of you. Um, do you assume a constant methane sink? And if so, what role do you think changes in methane sink could play? Post 2007 rise. Chen, do you want to start? I, you want to start? I, I have an answer to this, so maybe. Go, 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 go. Yeah, yeah. So um, I do assume a constant methane sink, uh, but I tried, so the inversion requires a some specification of the methane sink. And by methane sink, it's not just OH, it's chlorine and you know oxygen, 1D, all of those. And I tried a few different instances of those to see if a different specification of, let's say, the chlorine sink would change the, the this, this conclusion that you know about 40% is from fossil. And the answer is no. So it will it one what happened when I changed the methane sink was that it changed the overall levels. 
but it didn't change this conclusion that most of it is not from fossil. The other angle I think you're going for is whether the methane sink itself could have a trend that would then in induce a trend in methane that would, you know, that would explain all of this rise. And we tried that. So we imposed a trend on the methane sink that would be enough to explain the observed trend in methane. What happens is that then you cannot explain the trend in C13. So you cannot find the methane sink change that would explain both the C13 and the methane trend. Uh, uh, for for the methane sink question, I so we, we in our box model study we do consider the varying uh, OH concentration. So uh, I because the time limit, I didn't show the plot uh, in this presentation. I we we first we 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 have the we we run the box mode in the inverse mode to get the 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 mass the, the OH concentration of varying the time series of, of OH concentration, um, uh, and we plot it against the the MCF based uh, inversion result and the uh, and the uh, our system model result, and what one of the uh, and our results are quite. I mean, uh, uh, the one one message is uh, our derived uh, OH concentration is quite uh, high and is close to. I mean, is is has a high interannual variability, and the 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 the, the temporal pattern is quite close to uh, the MCF uh, based estimate. Brilliant. Thank you. It's a really interesting discussion. Um, now we're going to move to some questions for Hannah. Um, uh, these are a bit more technical, but also think very interesting. Hannah, what price are you paying in terms of loss inform information in order to reduce computational cost? And additionally, could you explain a bit more on how the posterior flux is partitioned to sectorial sources such as fossil, biogenic, and pyrophilic? Yes, I'm happy to. Um, so for the first question, in our case study, we're able to preserve about 72% of the information content as measured by the degrees of freedom per signal compared, and we do that by perturbing patterns of information content that correspond to about 98.5% of the information content in the system. So there is indeed some loss of information content relative to what we would expect given the information content that's spanned by the space that we're operating in. However, it's not significant. We reduce the computational cost by 25% in exchange for a much smaller reduction in information content. We actually find that we can preserve about 50% of the information content at um, an order of magnitude lower computational cost. So if I only do 200 model runs, I can still preserve half of the DOFs compared to 2,000 to achieve the full DOFs. Now, this is an interesting question in the context uh, in which I could construct the full Jacobian as in the case study I show here when there's only 2,000 model runs. But in other cases, like this inversion that I'm now working on of uh, Tacoma observations over North America, my state vector has 24,000 elements to it. Um, and it's computationally infeasible to construct the Jacobian at that resolution. And so at that point, the question is, okay, I, I can't, this is not computationally feasible. How can I minimize the loss of information content? Um, and I, I think that this method reduces the the loss that is that does occur when you reduce the computational cost. As for the question of source attribution, this is an interesting question. A lot of people propose different methods to deal with source attribution. I think in the context of this work, one could theoretically conduct an inversion in which the state vector elements themselves are um, partitioned by source. So instead of doing it on a grid box level, you could do it on a you know. Fossil emissions in this grid box, wetland emissions in this grid box is another state vector element. And that would obviously increase the computational cost if you were constructing the Jacobian in the standard scheme. But if you were to reduce the rank of the system, as I proposed, you could get posterior scaling factors sectorally um, that are sectorally attributed. Uh, I haven't done work on this, but I think it is a potential application of the method. Thanks, Anna. That's definitely something that's really interesting. Um, next question, um, perhaps for uh, Oshkar. Um, how does salinity affect the methane emissions? And what would sea level rise and saltwater intrusion cause 
uh, to the reduction of uh, methane production. And um, in the, on the same line, would sea level rise affect the hydrological and anaerobic state of uh, the drive CH4 production? Yes, uh, to answer, uh, answer this question, I just need to focus on that uh, uh, slide where I had presented the budget of methane and uh, the CO2. First of all, we our system from 2009 to 2019, we see a system which is most of the time a CO2 source so, and with, an range, with a release of ap averaging 356 grams of carbon, making it one of the highest emitting coastal wetland. Um, what I want, and again, again, if you look at the CH4 budget, the average budget was approximately 31 grams of carbon, which exceeds 95% of the wetlands globally. And uh, if you compare most of the coastal wetlands uh, emit fraction of that budget, approximately one to five grams. So we have a system where it is releasing CO2, it is releasing CH4. And these uh, values have been uh, confirmed by independent lab studies and aircraft based measurements. The one thing I didn't get to show was that along with this dynam along with this dynamics was that the low radial growth of the surviving trees. So if you drive along the side, you'll see ghost forest. Most of the trees are dead. The average diameter increment was only 0 0.072 millimeter. And so the, basically the trees are shrinking in diameter if you drive around that region. And uh, so obviously the trees are stressed, the trees are dying. So it, so which begs the question, what's going on? Because, and only other system where you have a CO2 release and CH4 release with, uh, is where the system is there, has been disturbed. And I, and I based on the Twitter studies, I've seen where systems have been drained, where there's severe drought, where they're degraded or actively grazed. But if I then go back to and look at our disturbance history, the last documented human activity in the immediate vicinity of the study was a select timber harvest, of cedar and cypress for single production that was more than 90 years ago. So based and then the other factor is that we them, we have a, there has been no salinity detected within three to five kilometers of a study area. Within three to six kilometers study area, there has been no salinity. So which begs the question, based, so we can eliminate these factors. So which begs the question, maybe it's a hydrology which is putting the system at stress. Why? Because, and so based on that, we are saying that increasing length of the hydro period as a result of the sea level rise is slowing the drainage of water from the land. And this, this causing a transition of the ecosystem, which is having a long in inundation period. And this transition of this because of long inundation period is well documented. So we are hypothesizing that sea level rise, which has been approximately 20 centimeters since 1977, may have altered the hydrology uh, and the overall drainage of the precipitation. I mean, let's not forget we are the system, the study site where we have is experiencing sea level rise, which is for quite much higher than the average uh, uh, sea level rise we see across the USA. So like the coastal North Carolina has a sea level rise, which is like, I believe more than nearly four times, uh, nearly twice than observed, nearly more four times that to see uh, that in the average uh, coastal plains. And we have seen similar dynamics of CO2 and CH2 release from Louisiana. The long-term trend for sea level rise is more than twice and observed in North Carolina. So once we've eliminated disturbance history, once we've eliminated the aspect of salinity, we are hypothesizing that sea level rise causing uh, hydrological stress, which is then le leading to the system under stress and which is then releasing CO2, CH4. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, we have some questions for Dan. Um, so, how do you uh, weight different types of uh, data, including your multi-scale inversion? And additionally, can you use these to get a finer temporal resolution? For example, zonal fluxes. Yeah, these are these are great questions. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, starting with the combining observations, this is a pretty uh, key point because we're talking about different observations on different scales, different resolutions, sensitivity to emissions, etc. And so. You know, one way that we propose in this analysis is to take account of it in your observation error covariance matrix. So, you know, assuming that each observation you make from each system has some sort of spatial or temporal uh, error correlation to them, and then populating your off diagonals to uh, 
to account for that error correlation length scale, you know, getting those correlation length scales is a little bit tricky. So, you know, we assumed like a 50 kilometer length scale, but, um, you know, there's reasons to think maybe it should be longer or shorter. Um, the, the other element is not just, and that, that's within unique observing systems, but within like disparate observing systems, you know, there's also kind of a, a second level of off diagonal element that we consider. And that's when you have, let's say a tropomy observation that's right over a tower, or at least in the vicinity of the tower, you would expect that the model error would be correlated between those observations. And so trying to figure out, you know, what's the correlation between those observations and then how far apart are they in time and space and populating those. So again, we suggest some options for that in the paper, but we try to take care of that all in the, um, the error covariance matrix. Um, getting to the point of diurnal flux, this is this is a great question. This is something we'd really like to do, and I'm sure many of you who are who are uh, modelers also understand that you do run into issues often with boundary layers at night when you're trying to assimilate those types of observations. So, you know, the great thing about a surface network is you can get observations all day, all night, but then at night, you know, it's really hard to simulate transport. So, um, you know, in this paper, we try to we try to do that for um, so we can still use those observations, but just assume a higher error on those observations, but we don't actually then go in and try to optimize fluxes for them as well. And so, yeah, it's a good question. And, and I think we're probably approaching that, um, but you know, that's still a, a TBD. Thank you, Dan. We also have some questions for uh, Kwang Yu. Uh, someone's asking, uh, how can you rescale your results to regional from the flux towers? Um, and you also show some la time lags or hysteresis, um, which makes it difficult to understand what the drivers of methane emissions are and what sort of data would help you resolve this issue. Okay, so for the first question for upscaling, that, <clears throat> that's uh, so right now we have, we didn't show in the presentation, but we have a, a upcoming work analyzing the regional and global within the same mission and uh, compare the button up, uh, compare the estimate between the button up and top down, top down approaches. And one of the metric that we did in that analysis is to compare the functional relationships between methane emission and temperature to see if a particular uh, upscaling, uh, if a product from a particular upscaling scheme from a button up model represent the historic temperature relationship we found in side level measurements. And if we can find that kind of relationship, that means, well, the upscaling um, approach is reasonable. If not, so, so we'll uh, give them more credit uh, for the overall ensemble product. Um, and I'm sorry, I've missed the second part of your question. The second bit was um, which sort of data could help you solve the issue of high stresses or time lags to understand the drivers of methane emissions? Um, so um, right now we uh, use the eddy covariance data um, and the chamber measurements to help us constrain the ecosystem scale models to understand what are the processes uh, uh, regulating methane, within methane emissions. Um, Thank you. Um, we have time for one last question. So we have two minutes left and there's a general question. How can we use better ethane, propane, other fuses, for fossil fuel gases link with natural gas? Um, I guess to improve our understanding of the methane cycle. Um, are there any aircraft campaigns able to measure this? Anyone wants to answer this? Yeah, oh. I can. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, there definitely are aircraft campaigns. There are quite a few routine aircraft profiles taken, especially over the US and Canada. Uh, the, the tricky part is tying emissions of these other gases to emissions of methane, because the ratio of how much ethane is emitted or propane is emitted from a site to methane has not been a constant over the last couple of decades. 
So you can't automatically measure one, get a trend and multiply by a number and say, well, here's the methane emission. So that is the tricky part here. They've slowly become decoupled for various reasons. But yes, there are aircraft, both campaigns and regular monitoring efforts that measure all of these gases. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I think we are at the end of our session. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for your fantastic talks and your time. And we are now going to the five minute break and then to the next session. Thank you everyone, bye bye.
Greetings, my name is Gami Strasser from the US Carbon Cycle Science Program Office. My, um, I'd like to um, welcome all of you to this uh, last organized uh, session of the day before, before the breakout sessions. Um, my co-chair uh, for the session is uh, Dr. Marcy Liedbach, and uh, the session title is Vulnerability, Resilience, Adaptation and Mitigation in the Context of Carbon Climate Feedbacks. Carbon climate feedbacks affect the global carbon cycle and future climate projections. Current estimates of the remaining carbon budget to meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius target do not include these possible Earth system feedbacks, such as carbon uh, release from permafrost and tropical wetlands. Improving our understanding of carbon climate feedbacks across time scales and, and regions is necessary to first identify which systems are vulnerable or resilient to predicted change and then evaluate possible responses to either meet targets or adapt the predicted to predicted changes. The speakers from this session will address these topics and please stay with us till the very end. We'll have uh, questions and answers live. Uh, so submit your questions via slido.com slash NACP. Thanks and see you soon. Hi, this is Hans Pearl. I'm going to give you a talk on the uh, new normal of catastrophic tropical cyclone flooding that's impacting North Carolina and what that means for organic matter and uh, nutrient cycling. So why are we concerned about tropical cyclones? Well, you know, you might think it's obvious, but there are lots of impacts, including large hydrologic perturbations, uh, lots of water quickly and persistent. Uh, increased nutrient organic matter inputs, changes in sediment dynamics, and of course there are water quality, habitat, and food web impacts. And the main reason for concern is that we're into a period of tropical cyclone, uh, elevated tropical cyclone activity, and North Carolina is a hot spot experiencing a hot moment. And you can see that by the increase in frequency of uh, major tropical cyclones and where we are there in eastern North Carolina. I'm going to focus in on the uh, largest, uh, second largest estuary in the country, uh, the Albemarle Pamlico Sound System, which is really an important system in that it uh, supports a large portion of the North Carolina fishery or southeast fishery, drains over half of the coastal plain of North Carolina and southeast Virginia. It's had huge expansion of agriculture and urban development, and it's lagoonal, so stuff that gets in stays there for a long period of time. And it's been impacted by this increased frequency of tropical cyclones, 34, to say the least, in 25 years. Uh, the data I'll be presenting deals with uh, two monitoring programs, ModMon and FerryMon. They're space-time intensive monitoring programs for the Albemarle Sound system and the new, ri new river estuary component, which you see there on the left-hand side. Uh, and... Uh, Let's first look at nitrogen and phosphorus inputs from storms. And what I've done is I've plotted the data starting at New Bern at the head of the Neuse River estuary going into Pamlico Sound. Uh, so we're really looking at the loads there. And if we look at nitrogen loads, we can see in years where we have hurricanes or tropical cyclones, uh, there are huge impacts to nitrogen loading. And um, if you look at, for example, um, 99 when we had three hurricanes and uh, more recently with Florence and Matthew in 2018 and 2016 they overwhelmed the annual load of nitrogen um, through the system and then in 1997 we didn't have a storm so you can see that it's virtually flat so bottom line is uh, these storms deliver huge amounts of nitrogen way above the uh, baseline uh, that we normally see and if we look at phosphorus we get a very similar uh, picture so from a nutrient loading perspective, these uh, events are huge. They, the nutrients then, of course, are translated into primary production. And in the case of the uh, North Carolina estuaries, we're looking mainly at plankton, phytoplankton production. And you can see there is a strong relationship there between uh, the uh, uh, loads that we see or discharge coming to the estuary and the response of chlorophyll A in the system. So, you know, it's supporting a lot of new primary production that by the way that primary production of course is translated into carbon ultimately uh, and uh, algal blooms and uh, water quality impacts with those 
Well, let's look at carbon as well. This is the, this be the delivery of carbon from the watershed to the uh, estuaries. And uh, this uh, conceptual diagram uh, from a paper that uh, Chris Osborne published with us, uh, you can see that uh, under uh, uh, no storm scenarios on the left versus high storm activities, you see the increase in carbon loading. And that carbon load is coming from all sorts of sources uh, up in the watershed, um, including wetlands and, um, of course, the upland uh, regions. Bottom line is a lot more carbon coming in. And if you look at the actual loads of carbon in the system, uh, again, looking from New Bern, you can see that the impacts on carbon loading are absolutely uh, huge as well. And if we look at DOC and POC in the lower left-hand graph, you can see that the percent increase over baseline uh, due to storms is, uh, is very large. And that carbon is then uh, transported through the estuary uh, into the sounds. And we had the good fortune of having um, Ryan Pearl um, actually do respiration measurements at the same time as we were doing our monitoring. And you can see that when we had big storm events, in this case, um, Hurricane Florence back in 2018, the respiration rate increases uh, dramatically. So that means there's obviously CO2 produced from the uh, carbon that's loaded. That CO2 flux is significant, it's highly significant. And if we look at the two estuaries that we've been looking at, the Noose and New River, you can see that the uh, uh, the actual CO2 that's emitted from the system above that uh, black line is very large in these uh, tropical storm events. And of course, when there are no storms, we get CO2 uh, influx into the system. Uh, the bottom line is that one tropical cyclone can liberate as much CO2 as what's fixed annually by phytoplankton. So again, very big impacts on carbon. And here's sort of a summary of the uh, uh, pre during and post hurricane scenarios that we see. Uh, you can see that the system is really uh, very sensitive to organic matter loading in the context of uh, uh, the carbon loads, but also being converted to CO2. So the system's really emitting a lot of CO2 during the storm events, and then it gets back more to the uptake scenario afterwards. So we're concerned about all this because the frequency uh, of these major wet storm events is increasing. And in fact, six out of seven of the wettest tropical cyclones have occurred in the last 20 years. Uh, that means that more intense and wetter hurricanes have led to more losses of carbon, increased uh, loading and brownification, and then the real worrisome feedback, which is more storms, more carbon mobilization, more CO2 released. Is that leading to more storms? So what can we do about this? Uh, Obviously, N and P are leading to algal blooms. Carbon is increased, leading to more CO2 flux. Uh, the new normal is really dominating all this. So we need to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases, uh, carbon management, including sustainable development in the systems, and uh, better tools for monitoring. Hello, my name is Scott Getz, and I'm the science lead of NASA's Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. Uh, above is a large-scale NASA activity focused on the Arctic and boreal domain of North America. Um, and the overarching science question is how vulnerable or resilient are ecosystems and society to environmental change in the Arctic and boreal biomes? Uh, the leadership group also includes Chip Miller, Peter Griffith, Libby Larson, Liz Hoy, Hank Margolis, and Mike Falkowski. Um, uh, this is a graphic from uh, the IPCC Fifth Assessment Report, um, just giving some sense of the myriad ways in which the Arctic boreal domain is changing. This is a graphic we put together specifically for the report, but much of it is highly relevant to the uh, research going on as part of above, including fire disturbance, permafrost thaw, 
river export, uh, forest productivity, tundra, shrub expansion, and so on, and all the feedbacks of those to climate. Um, a critical part of above is scaling from leaf level observations up through plot level field measurements to flux towers to aircraft to satellites and deriving products all along the way and then using those products ultimately at a, at a broader scale, typically at a broader scale like from satellite observations to inform ecosystem models or terrestrial biosphere models. Uh, a critical part of that scaling activity is uh, covered by airborne uh, measurements of which uh, we had quite extensive campaigns in 2017 and 2019 with some additional flying in 2018. Additional flying beyond that has been postponed by the COVID pandemic uh, canceled our field work and airborne measurements last year, uh, 2020, as well as uh, likely this year to be at the very least scaled back. But as you can see, the, the coverage that we've um, been able to accomplish in prior years is quite extensive using a variety of different instruments, multi-frequency SAR, uh, different types of LIDAR, discrete return and full waveform, um, solar-induced fluorescence, uh, hyperspectral, uh, as well as uh, additional airborne uh, trace gas concentration measurements. So quite an ambitious and extensive undertaking. Uh, the above science team is large. It's a very uh, large activity overall. It's sort of the latest incarnation or um, a version of uh, NASA's multidisciplinary field campaigns, coordinated and integrated. Um, currently, there are uh, 93 NASA-funded projects as part of ABOVE, plus another 25 affiliated projects, including Canadian uh, efforts through Polar Knowledge Canada, as well as a variety of academic uh, projects, supported projects. There are some 285 project leads and co-investigators, nearly 800 science team members, over 1,500 participants, meaning uh, people who follow what goes on in, as part of above and the progress being made. So that might include land managers, for instance, as well as graduate students and postdocs and so on. Thus far, we've had uh, over 300 peer-reviewed publications already out and in print, in addition to 180 data sets archived, that's as of this moment. Um, many more data sets are already planned for uh, being archived uh, and in or some form of advancement. So again, it's a quite a large undertaking. Uh, and much of the science that takes place as part of above is through the thematic uh, working groups, uh, which are um, outlined here. They're not exactly matching what's on this graphic, but quite similar carbon dynamics, permafrost and hydrology, uh, wildfire and ecosystem services, fire and insect disturbance, vegetation dynamics, vegetation structure, and so on. Um, so this is where a lot of the work gets done via these thematic working groups. Um, and they have also initiated uh, quite a number of synthesis activities uh, as part of the working groups. Many of them are cross working group activities. Uh, there's a number of them listed here, which I won't go into in any detail. Um, and they are at various stages of completion at this point, which is about the halfway point for the expected 10 year lifespan of above. So these are ongoing and really quite a key part of what we're doing is uh, for above, which is these cross-disciplinary, cross-working group synthetic activities. 
And another key goal and objective is capturing this variability, this vulnerability and resiliency in models. And we do that through a model data integration framework, as well as model development and, uh, and expansion and improvement um, and integration, again, with a lot of satellite data input to those. So that's a key part of what we do. The next and final phase of above will have a key component focused on um, the socio-ecological aspects of the system. Um, this is just an example showing caribou and caribou migrations, which are really critical to many of the um, communities in the region. Um, so this is likely to be, not caribou specifically, but the socio-ecological aspect of above is likely to be a key part of what we, where we go from here. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi, I'm Simone Allen. I live in and work on the lands and waters of the coast and inland Salish people. Jan Newton and Melissa Poe lead the project team for the research I'll discuss today. And NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program funded us to synthesize existing oceanographic and biological data and conduct new social science research to assess the vulnerability of Washington's coastal ecosystems and the treaty tribes to the rapidly changing ocean conditions we are witnessing on the Pacific coast. The Olympic coast has been home for millennia to four coastal treaty tribes the Quinault Indian Nation, and the Macaw, Ho, and Quileute tribes, who are highly dependent on the region's productive waters. Situated in the northeastern Pacific Ocean, the Olympic coast is naturally exposed to low oxygen, high carbon dioxide conditions, and we've experienced strong and long-lasting long marine heat waves since 2014. Decreasing oxygen and increasing CO2 in the ocean thus act to worsen conditions that already crossed biological sensitivity thresholds during pre-industrial times. The tribes of the Olympic Coast co-manage the re marine resources in partnership with U.S. federal and state agencies. And as our project partner Joe Schumacher, a, a marine scientist for Quinault Indian Nation, says, we have a responsibility to know so we can plan for an uncertain future. In this slide, you can see some of the species important to Washington tribes and ecosystems, and I'll briefly describe impacts observed in the last decade. Olive snails, important macaw cultural resources, experienced a mass mortality event. A Dungeness crab desert has developed on parts of the Washington shelf. The die-off of sea stars and changes in sea urchin abundance are changing coastal ecosystem structure and tribal resource availability. More than half the salmon stocks in the region are of moderate to significant concern for extinction. All of these species have known or likely sensitivity to ocean acidification, which is caused by ocean uptake of anthropogenic CO2. An unprecedented harmful algal bloom and marine heat wave also affected availability of these marine food sources to humans, marine mammals, and seabirds. Thus, our region is a natural laboratory for understanding rapid ocean change and its impact on ecosystems and people. The Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary has been measuring bottom water conditions at the sites in yellow to monitor for hypoxia since 2006. The moorings are offshore from the coastal tribes, so they represent ocean conditions in the usual and accustomed fishing areas of each tribal nation, giving this work an important environmental justice angle. I'll use data from these two sites to show you what we've learned through data synthesis. Here are the oxygen data from these two sites. And aragonite saturation values that I calculated from oxygen and temperature data, reflecting the availability of carbonate ion in seawater for shell building. Using accepted thresholds for when oxygen and aragonite saturation levels become harmful, we see that conditions are worth, worse for both parameters at the southern site. Conditions are typically stable in the north throughout the summer upwelling season, but progressively worsen in the south over the same time frame. Finally, aragonite saturation occurs far more frequently than hypoxia at all sites. The life cycle cartoon shown here reflects that adult Dungeness crab live in the habitats these observations represent. We created climatologies, or long-term averages, for oxygen and aragonite saturation in Dungeness habitat, shown here for the southern site. Oxygen tends to dip below the hypoxia threshold during August and September today. Using anthropogenic carbon, carbon dioxide estimates to calculate pre-industrial aragonite saturation, 
we learned that corrosive conditions begin earlier, last longer, and are more severe now than during the pre-industrial. End of century projection suggests that hypoxia will increase in frequency here more than corrosiveness because undersaturation is already so prevalent. For biological synthesis, Hallie Berger, a student with our Yukon partners, assessed Dungeness crab sensitivity across life stages to low oxygen and pH and projected that under conditions in 2100, vulnerability to low pH will be a year-round concern across life stages while low oxygen vulnerability will remain seasonal and predominantly affect adults. Our regional ocean modeler, Sam Sidlecki, provides seasonal forecasts of ocean conditions to tribal and state resource managers to facilitate fisheries management and adaptation over seasonal timescales. This snapshot of August 2021 oxygen and pH she forecasted in January. We work with tribal and state biologists to co-produce information managers need to inform decision points, such as the annual crab season opening dates. Synthesizing oceanographic and biological data and correctly understanding linkages among species, processes, and stressors is a daunting enough task, but the social context of human reliance on ocean resources is also complex. Our social scientists, Melissa Poe and Melissa Watkinton, work directly with tribal members to understand the social importance of ocean resources, socioeconomic conditions, and community risks. They conducted over 50 qualitative ethnographic interviews to understand traditional ecological knowledge and develop community-defined indicators with each tribe. The macaw identified components of community well-being, including cultural practices, identity and spirituality, physical health and safety, ocean stewardship and self-determination, which will help tribal leaders develop strategies to strengthen community health and adaptive capacity. Our team synthesized broad-ranging data on socioeconomic conditions to assess baselines, trends, and spatial and social heterogeneity or equity. And they held participatory workshops to assess indicators and the sensitivity of valued ocean resources and to prioritize potential adaptation actions that tribes can take to build resilience to ocean acidification. In closing, our diverse team of partners is working to understand how changing ocean conditions will affect marine ecosystems to help Pacific Northwest tribes adapt to rapidly changing ocean conditions. We've created a template for regional vulnerability analysis that can be exported to Alaska and other regions vulnerable to ocean acidification. And as a co-benefit, our team has cultivated new partners to get acidification indicators into regional to international assessments. Watch our short movie at YouTube at the link shown below. Thanks. Kama e koyana Deluci, and hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Cross, and I'm a researcher at NOAA PMEL that works on ocean acidification in Alaska. Today, I'm recording this presentation from Seattle, which is traditionally Duwamish land. I want to thank the organizers of AMSS as well as, as the Duwamish people for the honor of speaking with you today. Koyana. For those of you who may be new to ocean acidification science, I want to go through the basics of OA in Alaska. As we emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from various sources, the oceans soak it up. And when this happens in areas that already have a naturally high concentration of carbon dioxide, as waters around Alaska do, a cascade of chemical reactions can create pH conditions corrosive enough to dissolve calcium carbonates, otherwise known as ocean acidification events. Ocean acidification can have a variety of complex and nuanced impacts on marine biota that are commercially and culturally important in Alaska. Directly, it can reduce growth and survival of juvenile fish and shellfish, and indirectly, ocean acidification can reduce the abundance of prey for these commercially lucrative populations. It can also impact sensory functions for some fishes. Over time, the cumulative effects of these stresses may reduce the productivity of commercial and subsistence fish stocks. Just considering red king crab, for example, extensive laboratory studies and modeling efforts have shown that there could be a 50% decrease in catch and profits within just 20 years, amounting to as much as a billion dollars in welfare loss to Alaskan households. Combining our 10 years of observational knowledge of ocean acidification in the Alaska marine environment, 
and with the biological hazards of ocean acidifications in laboratory research led to the development of an ocean acidification risk index, showing that some communities in southeastern and southwestern Alaska may be most vulnerable to OA impacts, usually based on the limited economic diversity and strained food security in these areas. And all of this leads to the number one question I am asked whenever I am interacting with local Alaskans, what do we do now? People want to know what they can do to adapt to or mitigate those OA risks, but often these place-based strategies require high-resolution place-based knowledge. Our group bonding to that call for high-resolution localized information by building carbonate chemistry packages for reasonable models. These are outstanding tools for generating maps like the one I'm showing here. Without models, we are restricted to providing information at the triangles, black dots, and gray track lines that you otherwise see pictured representing our discrete observations. Models are capable of generating a lot of different kinds of output. Here we have chosen to highlight summertime bottom waters, a time period and area that could be especially important for some fisheries and which was identified and requested by our colleagues in fisheries management. Remember that projected 50% decline in Bristol Bay Red King crab? This analysis is based on a critical part of the year for that fishery. What I'm showing on this plot is a projection of bottom water acidified conditions under two emission scenarios, the extreme RCP 8.5 and more moderate RCP 4.5. The three different colors shown in these graphs correspond to three different pH thresholds that have been identified as important for crab. The first thing I wanna note is that the beginning of the graphs for both of these scenarios looks almost the same. This is because ocean acidification is a slow process, so the amount of CO2 we have already released into the atmosphere locks in a certain amount of impact. It's the later years that are more important. Effectively, by reducing our emissions to the RCP 4.5 level, we may be able to save 30% or so of the ideal growing season for crab, while the business as usual scenario means that we will probably lose most of the ideal growing season. While these while these co-developed metrics have been well received by the Alaska community, I also receive many questions about how we may be able to reduce ocean acidification risks instead of just adapting to what we think may be coming. This is a hugely challenging question, in large part because we know that the best way to limit ocean acidification impacts is to globally reduce emissions, but people are interested and invested in local scale actions. In particular, the commercial fishing community has urged us to investigate whether or not macroalgae like seagrasses and kelp could be used to mitigate ocean acidification, especially given that seaweed crops could have their own value. Globally, seaweed crops are valued at $10 billion per year. In Japan's nori production amounts to about $2 billion annually and is one of the world's most valuable crops. There's also a long tradition of indigenous mariculture in this area. This will require a lot of extended extensive testing, but we are excited that the community wants to work with researchers to assess whether or not these metrics work. One such study in Kodiak has involved industry, tribal partners, and researchers. Most notably, Alaskan locals are working with nonprofits like Green Wave and the Nature Conservancy to establish an Indigenous Kelp Farmers Bill of Rights that focuses on conservation, cultural respect, and sustainability from the beginning of a very newly burgeoning industry. In part, this community was only talking to each other because we as scientists and stakeholders have worked extremely hard to develop that communication infrastructure. Many regional communities around the United States have a coastal acidification network specifically designed to connect scientists to stakeholders so that they can listen to each other, talk to each other, and eventually coordinate their voices to take real substantive action. If you would like to participate in the conversation, join a community sampling program, or find out more about ocean acidification resources in your area, we encourage you to connect with your local coastal acidification network. Obviously, this is also not possible to complete without a large team of interdisciplinary researchers, and the data that I've shown you today is based on 10 years of discrete sampling that underpinned the validation effort for the model that I highlighted. I'm extremely grateful for all of the efforts of my team in supporting this work. Koyana, and thank you for listening to this pre-recorded oral presentation. For questions or feedback, you can reach me and my team at jessica.cross at noaa.gov.
Thanks, um, everyone, for uh, sticking with us till the um, almost the end of the day. Um, and thanks to all our um, uh, speakers uh, for joining us. Dr. Simon Aline will not be able to join us, uh, but she will accept questions. So feel free to jot down your questions via slido.com slash NACP. Uh, with this, let's start our questions and, and answer session. Um, Dr. Matthew back will ask the first question. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you all. Those were really, really great talks. Um, on that uh, question for you about if you are seeing uh, any evidence of the impacts on the system themselves, does it look like in terms of resilience, does it look like these systems are being altered in terms of being switched into a new state in terms of how their response to these events? Well, funny you should ask that. Um, I. Yeah, one of my one of our concerns is that uh, with the increased frequency of tropical cyclones, the system does show resiliency. But you know, we're now getting such a high frequency of these events that it's still recovering while it gets hit by a new event. So we've seen issues on everything ranging from phytoplankton changing community structure to fisheries being pretty seriously impacted, particularly uh, benthic species, you know, which have a hard time getting out of the way of uh, dead zones and things like that that are forming. And uh, with Pamlico Sound, we don't have um, that much data, but at least, um, I don't know, 15 years of data now in Pamlico Sound uh, indicate that the incidence of low of uh, bottom water hypoxia is very low there, but it has shown in response to these large storm events to occur. So. And we've had, for example, crab fishing and shrimp fishing being off by at least multiple years after some of these big events that we've had, uh, including Floyd back in 99, which everybody remembers, and uh, most recently Florence. So the answer, I think, is yes, we are seeing, uh, I don't know about a state change, but we're certainly seeing changes that are impacting uh, fisheries resources, and even the base of the food web, phytoplankton community structure. We're getting, for example, we're getting more freshwater uh, bloom species in the system, like cyanobacterial blooms going further down into the sound itself, which um, as far as I know, for the 40 plus years I've lived here, uh, we have never seen. So yeah, we are seeing it. I don't know whether it's going to be a state change or not, you know, it'd be nice to have uh, Personally, it'd be nice to have about five years of no hurricanes uh, here, and uh, hopefully we'll see that. Um, so um, uh, the next question is for Scott. Um, how will above address socio-ecological aspects with indigenous communities? Will they be involved in co-production of research? That's a great question. And uh, the answer is yes, uh, they will be and uh, have been. Some of that work is project specific. You know, it depends uh, what someone was selected and funded to work on. So of course, not everyone will have an element of that co-production, but um, some projects do. And then there's also been an effort by the leadership group, especially Libby, who's on the call today, uh, Libby Larson, who's uh, been really quite engaged along with Peter Griffith in uh, making sure that we establish those links with indigenous communities in, um, in Western Canada and in Alaska um, and bring those, those groups in not only on the research, but with sharing their perspectives and their knowledge from having lived in these, this uh, area, this domain of Western Canada and Alaska for, for many generations. Um, and we also have invited uh, Indigenous speakers to our science team meetings, and uh, that's, actually, that's actually gone very well, and there's a great deal of interest in it. So. Great question, and I'm and I'm glad to say we are, we are doing that. 
And some projects, again, more than others, are really pushing forward that co-production of knowledge element. Amy, we're having some trouble hearing you. Oh, there can you, you hear go. me now? Okay. That's better. Okay. Um, could you share uh, thoughts? This is for Jess. Could you share thoughts on potential vulnerabilities of climate intervention strategies to ocean acidification? Sure. So <clears throat> when we think about, you know, really starting to uh, 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 really starting to engage in some of these mitigation projects. Uh, there are a lot of unknowns, um, uh, especially when we're choosing, you know, to engage in uh, carbon dioxide removal techniques that may not be a part of the system naturally. Uh, so the nice thing, uh, you know, with all this interest surrounding kelp farming in Alaska, there's a long indigenous history of mariculture in the region. Uh, and so we know that kelp farming has been a part of that ecosystem for a little while and it can be, that it can be conducted sustainably. Uh, that being said, um, there are other methods of carbon dioxide removal that are um, that can be riskier or at least riskier because we don't know much about them. Uh, and that could include techniques like alkalinity enhancement or electrochemical CO2 stripping. That's sort of the same thing as a desalination plant where you draw in seawater to an electrical chamber or across a membrane and you'd strip the carbon dioxide back out of it. Um, there's just, we just physically do not know a lot about uh, any of these strategies. And so when we start to think about using them for specific purposes, um, I would argue that we need to do a lot more research so that we can better understand those risks. Uh, when it comes to taking action on climate change, um, uh, and you know, considering the risks that we face, you know, already the risk that we have that we face because you know we've emitted carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that's been soaked up by the ocean, um, you know, the risks that we face if we don't do anything about that, um, and the risks that we face if um, uh, the risks that we face if we take some of these intervention strategies. All three of those pieces of the portfolio have to be considered together in order to come up with a viable strategy. Thank you, Jess. Um, we have three minutes left. Uh, shall we ask the last question, Marcy? Oh. Sure. So this is a question for Hans. And the question is, if a decision maker asks how are hurricanes and carbon cycle related, what can we do about that? What, what would you yeah. tell them? Yeah, no. And I've been asked that question. So uh, I'm maybe somewhat prepared. Uh, so uh, we're losing a lot of carbon. Uh, from more intense and wetter storm events. That carbon is generating more CO2. Uh, that CO2 is adding to the burden that's already in the atmosphere. That's presumably part of what's warming our atmosphere, uh, potentially leading to more hurricanes. So there's this evil spiral, you know, kind of lurking out there, uh, at least uh, for me anyway. So what can we do about that? Uh, the most important thing is adjusting our land management to deal with these wetter storms so that we can minimize the loss of carbon and other nutrients. I might, I might add nitrogen and phosphorus too, uh, thereby at least try to minimize the uh, impacts that we're seeing on the carbon cycle that way. But of course, the real answer and the answer to most of the, these questions about what can we do about it is to reduce fossil fuel emissions. Um, you know, because that's the big banana, the big package to reduce. Um, and also reduce nutrients because the nutrients are adding to the CO2 that's being generated as well, because we're having eutrophication in a lot of these uh, estuarine systems. So, you know, um, it really boils down to uh, land management of nutrients and carbon into our coastal environment. Um, I don't know, you know, this uh, sort of evil cycle kind of thing is something that's been kind of spinning around in my mind. It's really something that needs to be addressed by the big picture, you know, carbon modeling folks. But if you can envision this sort of going on and on and on, 
with more carbon being deposited in estuarine systems and coastal systems. And Joey Croswell, one of my students, showed that one storm can, can emit as much CO2 uh, just from mixing and uh, you know venting back into the atmosphere is what's being fixed by the phytoplankton in one year. So it's not a trivial uh, set of sort of reactions that's going on there uh, in the system. And I might just one other comment, if I, if I may, uh, the ocean acidification issue is really complicated in estuaries because of all these interactions. You know, we have uh, acidification going on with organic matter coming in, but then we have eutrophication going on, which is sucking up CO2. And uh, the two long term data sets from both the Pamlico Sound System and Chesapeake Bay indicate that. At times, we actually have basification going on, depending on you know how the balance between uh, respiration from this organic matter and uh, nutrient stimulated uh, eutrophication are interacting. So it's it's much more complicated than open ocean acidification or acidification in places where we don't have this massive amount of uh, perturbation that's going on in our watersheds. Thank you, Hans. Um, we have a few minutes left. Uh, before we wrap up, I would like to remind everyone that we have um, several posters uh, uh, that have been submitted to this session. So please uh, check them out uh, via the, uh, the meeting website. And they're all very interesting. And you can submit questions and, and interact with the poster present presenters also. Um, so, uh, at the end, I mean, I mean, unless we, Marcy, do you have any final questions? Uh, I have a question um, okay. for Scott. I, I was wondering, so you guys are five years in now. Like, what, what would you, what, have you had any big surprises, would you say, in terms of the results that you guys are finding? Uh, maybe not surprises, but um, I guess I would say I'm pleasantly surprised or pleased overall at just how well um, above is unfolding. Uh, you know, there was a lot of planning went into it. It took many years just to get it off the ground. Uh, and as I, as I talk about in the presentation, it's, it's been enormously successful by any measure. I mean, in terms of peer reviewed publications, engagement, you know, really big sessions at AGU every year. Um, and the airborne campaigns have been extremely ambitious and we've had some hiccups with those um, but in general it's gone extremely well so i guess if anything i'm surprised at how, how well it's gone giving all the things that could possibly go wrong <laughs> so hopefully we'll keep on that track i guess you know one one major obstacle we've had to deal with of course like everyone is the pandemic we haven't been able to do field work uh, last year, and we'll be lucky if we can do any this year, um, just because of needing to be extremely cautious with, you know, bringing anything into a remote community that's ill prepared for that. So, but in general, it's a it's a great success. Jess or Hans, uh, like to say any any closing thoughts at the end before we wrap up. And Scott, of course, in addition to what you already said. I just wanted to mention one thing, and that is that uh, because we only had seven minutes to give the talk, there's a lot of sort of conclusions in my slide. But if it, since it's recorded anyway, I think the answers for managers like the uh, um, uh, what Marcy asked, for example, decision makers, it's there. It's there in the uh, concluding, you know, um, conclusions. And that's a really good question. I think we have to be prepared to make to uh, to be able to answer these questions in a very simple way, so that decision makers can, uh, you know, get it in one sentence. You know, I really like that, Hans. That as we, you know, especially as the demand for this information grows, um, we have to be prepared to give 
an answer of some kind, even if it's not, you know, the best scientific answer that we would like to be able to give. And, you know, as scientists, that can often make us really uncomfortable sort of balancing the, Definitely. you know, what we know that we don't know is enormous just because we are experts um, and sort of balancing that with the necessity of taking action, right? You know, uh, at this point, I, I saw a calculation somewhere that, that you know, the, the time of emergence of these impacts of ocean acidification, of enhanced storm activity, of, you know, so many other climate change uh, impacts is relatively short compared to our capacity to observe them to the level that we would want to. Like, we're not going to be able to achieve this kind of perfect set of knowledge that we would like to have before we start, you know, engaging with decision makers. Uh, and we have to be willing to bridge that gap. Yeah, so I agree. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but yeah. Those thoughts, uh, we're, we're all very inspired and uh, we're ready for action, I guess. Um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, my fellow co chair, Marcy Litvak, uh, for um, leading this session with me and, and also us. Uh, Thank um, Dr. Jessica Cross, Dr. Hans Pearl, and Dr. Scott Kurtz um, um, for uh, being part of this session. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we. Thank you so much. So with this, uh, we're going to take a five-minute break. Uh, before we move on to the um, breakout sessions. Uh, and I hope all our speakers will also be able to join us. Um, so the breakout sessions um, will um, be um, on a carbon cycle reanalysis. The second one will be on exploring linkages between the carbon cycle and biodiversity in North American ecosystems. And the third one will be on working with boundary organizations to extend impact. Uh, if you already registered for the session for the meeting, you should have received an email from uh, Dr. Bibi Larson with uh, separate uh, WebEx links to join each of those uh, breakout sessions. So please um, take a look at uh, the email you received from Dr. Bibi Larson and uh, click on your preferred uh, breakout uh, session link to join. Um, that um, a particular breakout. And with that, we'll see you in a few minutes. The breakout sessions start at 4.30 p.m. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.